so bravo. Uh, I thought I saw a glimpse of him uh, to city council or to council member Stephen Schwartz, um, who represents the Great Oak area. Thank you for taking time out of your schedule to attend our preview of Champions last fall. That event featured all of our high school marching bands and our middle school musicians as well. So next, uh, let me please welcome up the drum majors of the Spirit of Great Oak. They are the next generation. Wonderful role models and representatives and more eloquent spokespersons than I. Seniors Nicholas Gliona and Atlas Schaefer. <laughs> and our junior drum majors, Janelle Gachalian and Sherilyn Brown. On behalf of the Spirit of Great Oak, we want to thank Superintendent Dr. Jody McClay, the school board, and the administration for their acknowledgement of a pretty special accomplishment. On Saturday, November 20th, 2022, we attended the California State Band Championship State Finals. In order to attend, all groups there in competition had to qualify the week prior into Vision Championships in order to be invited to state finals. Out of a score of 100, groups had to earn a score of 84 or more to have a chance to qualify. Great Oak went in seated second place with a score of 89.2. By the end of the evening, we scored a 94.425. We had been awarded with the overall best color guard, the overall best drumline, and the overall best general, general effect for our competitive field show, The World Awaits. The theme of our show, The World Awaits, was inspired from words spoken about travel. As we grow as people, we hope to represent these four qualities, to be kind, to be honest, to be hardworking, and the fourth, to be curious. To be curious about the world around us, to experience different cultures, to learn and grow. More importantly, to travel. And when you're ready to start your adventure, just go. You see, on March 11th of 2022, we were all taken by surprise on the steps of City Hall when the Spirit of Great Oak was honored to learn that we have been selected to march in the New Year's Day Parade in Rome, Italy. That event will take place at the end of this year. Essentially, we will be the first event on this historic streets of Rome in 2024. Dr. McClay th was there that day when the banner was unveiled, inviting us to this special event. We are forever grateful for to, and look forward to representing you, Dr. McClay. The Temecula Valley Unified School District, Great Oak High School, and our community and families on the world stage. This time next year, we would be honored to stand before you and tell you about our performance adventure. We'll be able to tell you what we learned from more than 2,000 years of history that we will experience firsthand in Rome. I also have the feeling we'll be able to tell you a lot more about Italian culture, art, and of course, food. Clearly, as you saw from the video, the judges were just as impressed with our performance and the inspiration behind The World Awaits. Well, we are proud of this accomplishment. We've learned that input equals output. If you are passionate about something, if you care about the people on your team, if you listen to the feedback of experts and are willing to put in the time to get better each rehearsal, then you have the chance to become a champion. Last spring, our winter drumline was a gold medal champion, and that trend continued to this past fall. Next, it is our pleasure to introduce our Great Oak leadership team, Dr. Amber Lane and Mr. Herschel Ramirez. <laughs> Mr. Ramirez has stuff in his hand, so I'm gonna let him go first. So if you've never been to the Great Oak High School Gymnasium, we have adornments, awards, plaques of championships, league championships, state championships, and finally, for the first time in school history, we have...
So we look forward to uh, posting this on the home wall foyer um, and looking forward to celebrating you um, at Great Oak. Well past the years will be here. Great, great job. Thank you for your legacy, Wolfpack. Congratulations. Absolutely. Um, I just want to add, um, I just want to add one thing because I think it's important that our students did an amazing job, but without their band director and their wonderful families that are also here, they wouldn't have gotten this um, championship. So students, can you also give your band director and your families a big round and of coaches. applause? And coaches. Yeah. And if I'm correct, we have some more presentations and then eventually we will get some photos. We do, yes. Okay, Great Oak Band, if you'll give us a few more minutes then we're gonna ask you to go outside. There's so many of you, we couldn't get your pictures in here, so we actually have some drones set up overhead that are, gonna, that are going to fly over and get your big group picture. But before we do that, I believe we have some golden bears in the house. Yeah. Yes. So Mrs. Leone, our interim principal, and Mr. Harney, our athletics director, are going to tell you why we are honoring our Golden Bears tonight. Good evening to Dr. McClay, the assistant superintendents, and the governing school board. Thank you for taking the time tonight to honor the Temecula Valley High School student athletes. My name is John Harney, and I'm the assistant principal of athletics. With me is Donna Leone, the principal of Temecula Valley High School. On behalf of the Riverside County of Education, community engagement and partnership, and Temecula Valley High School, we are proud to recognize our girls and boys cross country teams. 43 high schools submitted multiple rosters with GPAs for the fall grading period. Only five schools had teams with the highest GPAs. Um, our boys had an average GPA of 4.08, and our girls had a 4.32 GPA average out of all of Riverside County. Um, marking the highest GPA. As the athletic director, and as, the, as uh, Ms. Leone will note, uh, we are proud that they embody what it truly means to be a student athlete. Uh, they spend miles and hours running uh, uh, to, to compete. Uh, and even this weekend, as a group, uh, ran a half marathon just to, just to get ready and practice. So uh, a truly great accomplishment. Uh, congrats to our coaches, Gary and Dana Polhill, who oversee them and uh, lead them in all these runs. They do a great job. And congrats to their families and the student athletes themselves who make the time commitment to not only their athletic, uh, athletic skills, but also their academics. Uh, we're proud that they're representative of Temecula Valley High School in both uh, on, the, on the track and uh, in the classroom. <laughs> this is Gary Polo who's going to announce we, have a, we don't have 100 on our cross country teams, but we're going to They're announce. outside. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're all outside. No, we really are proud of our athletes. And, uh, all of them aren't here tonight, but I'm going to read everybody's name. Half of them are home studying, I think, so uh, <laughs> that's why they got a 4.3 and a 4.1. But we are really proud. They're hard workers, and I can't say enough of them. If I call your names, come on up, please. Let's see. Elijah Anderson. <laughs> and Natalia Canapari. Just go ahead and sit. Janai Shemang, Shemang, Nick DeBlaine, Jillian Dimitrioff, Vincenzo Gilly, Keegan Harney, hey Vincenzo, uh, Sierra Koch, did Sierra make it? She made it. Eliza McInlino. Heidi Manson. <laughs> Hallie Murphy. <laughs> Owen Parsley. 
Caden Rusty. Victoria Root, not here. Trevor Ruff, Roof. Julian Santos. Vicky. Jackson Stewart. Megan Thamer. And Rachel Thamer. And Ava Wetlaufer. We really want to mention, out of all the, uh, the uh, sports, the fall sports in all of our district, this cross country for girls and boys separate were the only two teams that won academic excellence, the highest academic uh, scores in all of Riverside County. So we think that's great and I appreciate it. These guys are hard workers and thanks again. And I'd also like to thank my wife, who helps me every day. She's back there, <laughs> hiding. Dana Paul. Here. That's it. OK, you guys might be able to take a picture inside. Yeah, you, students, okay, you're going to enter follow. out this door that way. So you're going to head right out toward the right. Thank you, school board members. Great, thank you. And, uh, and at this time, I'd like to invite up um, Mr. Rob Sousa from Day Middle School. He's going to be presenting the California League of Educators Middle School finalist. When it comes to citing sources, <laughs> details matter. Introducing Grammarly's citation. Not working? All right. Good evening. I'm Rob Sousa. I'm the principal at Day Middle School. Uh, Dr. McClay, uh, Cabinet and Governing Board, it's a privilege, privilege to stand before you this evening. Uh, being an educator is a very difficult job, as I'm sure you all are aware. Uh, being a critical life skills teacher that uh, Shelby is, is one of the most difficult jobs that I've ever seen someone do in a school district. Uh, Shelby regularly has uh, eight, nine, even 10 critical life skills kids, students who are medically fragile. Uh, she does an incredible job of managing a classroom of students, LVNs, instructional aides to make these kids feel special in our district. Uh, these students um, can be pushed aside in other places, in other countries, in other areas, but Shelby in our district makes them feel just like every other student. And she has created a culture at our school where her students are embraced as our students and not her students and their students. And so she's a, a blessing and it's a privilege to honor her uh, for this award that she was a finalist at, at Riverside County. And so I just want to say to you how grateful I am to have her on staff and the job that she does. He said, we're sitting over there, he said, did you prepare a speech? And I said, what? <laughs> but, um, but thank you. I love my job, and I love the students that I serve. And oh, I'm so emotional sometimes, but it's really an honor and a privilege um, to go to work every day. And DMS has a motto, one heart, one mind. And that's really just saying all students are everyone's students. And I really get to see that lived out every day. Um, and it's a blessing for me and my team and our site. So I'm really just accepting this on behalf of the culture of DMS. I think the people there are amazing at being unifying and inclusive. Um, and that's a beautiful thing to witness every day. So thank you. Okay, so we've, we've honored some students in Great Oak. Thank you for your patience. You're going to get to go out and get your pictures in just a minute. We've honored some of our amazing coaches, band director, teachers. But our last awards for this evening 
go to our governing board members. So we would actually like to have you come up and come and stand out here in front. As you may or may not be aware, January, don't be shy, there you go, come on up. January marks the school board recognition month. So we salute and honor our school board members. And it gives us an opportunity to let the students and the community know how hard this job really is. It's a lot harder than it looks and requires an inordinate amount of time and preparation. So just a little information and history for you. Roughly 5,100 California School Board trustees, which is the largest group of elected officials in the state, aid in supporting student success by establishing policies, benchmarks, and critical accountability for our public schools. January is the time that we recognize you, but we really thank you 12 months out of the year for your hard work and your dedication to supporting these programs, these students, their teachers, their staff, and their families. From the first public schoolhouse in an old church in San Francisco in 1850, California's boards of education have grown to oversee more than 1,000 school districts and county offices of education in the state of California. From the smallest district, which is four students, to our district, 27,000, and nearly 600,000 in the largest school district of Los Angeles Unified, our board trustees provide critical support to six million public school children in California. So on behalf of our entire district, our cabinet, our staff, our students, and our community, please everyone join me in thanking our board for your countless hours and dedication to supporting our kids in program. Now don't get too comfy and run back to your chairs because you're gonna get some photos as well. While you're taking your photos, students, we're gonna ask you to go out nicely and, and we've got the drone set up to get you in action as well. Thank you all for joining us for recognitions tonight. This is a call to order. So I, I can. So we're in item G, open session. Call to order. We're in item G, open session, business meeting. Call the meeting to order after closed session. So. Good evening and welcome to the regular open session meeting of the Temecula Valley Unified School District Board of Education on January 31st, 2023 at 6.07 p.m. The board has been in closed session since 4 p.m. H, um, you got the time. Attendance, we have governing board, Mrs. Allison Barclay, Mr. Danny Gonzalez, Dr. Joseph Komorowski, Mr. Stephen Schwartz. <coughs> Member Schwartz is attending this meeting via Zoom due to illness. Mr. Schwartz, we are required to ask and document if there are any other people over the age of 18 in the room where you are Zooming from. No. All right, thank you, Mr. Schwartz. And we have Mrs. Mrs. Jennifer Wiersma. We have the Secretary of the Board, Dr. Jody McClay, Superintendent. Ms. Nicole Lash, Assistant Superintendent, Business Support Services. Ms. Kimberly Valles, Assistant Superintendent, Educational Support Services. Mr. Frank Ars, Assistant Superintendent, Human Resource Development. Ms. Nicole Deus, Assistant Superintendent, Student Support Services. And Mrs. Lena, uh, Ac An uh, Anna Sabar, Executive Assistant to the Superintendent. And would everybody please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. If you're wearing a hat, kindly put it over your heart.
pledge allegiance to the flag, to the flag of the United States, States of America, and to, the republic, to the republic for which it stands, stands one nation, one nation one We're on to J, readout of action taken in closed session. And closed session began at 4 p.m. The Board of Education took the following action in closed session. It was moved by Member Wiersma and seconded by Member Schwartz to approve the recommendation of the Administrative Hearing Panel regarding the expulsion for case number 486. Five, three, and the vote was 5-0. It was moved by Member Gonzalez and seconded by Member Barclay to approve the recommendation of the Administrative Hearing Panel regarding the suspended expulsion for case number 318097. The vote was 5-0. It was moved by Member Barclay and seconded by Member Schwartz to approve the recommendation of the Administrative Hearing Panel regarding the expulsion for case number 307168, and the vote was 5-0. It was moved by Member Schwartz and seconded by Member Wiersma to approve the recommendation of the Administrative Hearing Panel regarding the expulsion for case number 307169. The vote was 5-0. Conference with Legal Counsel, Existing Litigation, Government Code Section 54956.9D1, Case OAH 20220090560. It was moved by Member Schwartz and seconded by Member Barclay to approve the settlement agreement OAH number 20220905060. And the vote was 5-0. It was approved by Member Schwartz and seconded by Member Barclay to approve the recommendation of the Administrative Hearing Panel regarding the waiver of suspended expulsion for case number 47380, and the vote was 5-0. Thank you, Ms. Wiersma. Um, K, recognitions, announcements, school-related organizations. Before the board meeting began, the board recognized our Inland Empire 2022 Social Science Educator of Excellence winner, our California League of Educators Middle School finalist, Great Oaks CSBC Gold Medal Championship, and TBHS's recognition for highest team GPA boys and girls cross country. We will now have our student spotlights, and I welcome up from Chaparral, Summer Rashidi and Avery Page. Hi everyone, as you heard, I'm Summer Rashidi, the ASB president at Chaparral High School. And I'm Avery Page, the ASB vice president. To start at SHAP, our peer leaders are leading a new program called PLUS, which stands for Peer Leaders Uniting Students. With this, they gather and allow student opinions to be heard on various school topics, through the use of student-led PLUS forum sessions. This is a great opportunity for us to improve our already great school. SHAP has, an, has advanced to Cyber Patriot semifinals. Uh, for those who don't know, Cyber Patriot is a competition that teaches students about cybersecurity. Um, and our, NJR to, oh, t sorry, our NJROTC team has made history by making it to the semifinals. So go them. Special shout out to the Shop Chaparral mock trial team who competed against Paloma Valley High School in round one of the 42nd, 42nd annual California mock trial competition. Using great discipline, perseverance, and skill, they won their first round, allowing them to continue into the state championship competition. We've been sending out emails and notices through Canvas to let our seniors know about um, upcoming scholarships. There are reminders for Dollars for Scholars, FAFSA, and any scholarship opportunity. Our winter athletes are starting to close off their seasons. Shout out to Boys Varsity Soccer who just had their senior night last night and was able to pull off a win. Their record is five to two. Great job, Puma boys. 
Um, our boys wrestling is on fire. They have their final game tomorrow to become CIF champions. Hopefully they win. And to, mo and to promote a big crowd, um, their game is themed whiteout. Girls water polo is currently in their carousel tournament, which determines lead rankings. They won their game last night against Mesa, and they're playing Great Oak to determine who gets third spot in league. If they win, they go to CIF. Good luck, girls. And our girls wrestling has also been doing amazing, and they play tomorrow night to become league champions. An effort to raise funds, our English department is hosting a school-wide movie night, dinner, and show. They'll be serving pizza and drinks, and the band House Arrest will be performing. House Arrest is a band made up of all CHS students, and this is their second time playing at a school-wide event because of the positive feedback and high student demand. Um, our improv group is so excited to perform in our new PAC. Their first show is going to be this Friday the 3rd, and I can't wait to watch them, and you all should too. Um, and a big thanks to you all for making these renovations happy, or, well, happen. I know everyone is so excited. <laughs> Shout out to Officer Bowers. Tomorrow during lunch, we have an event to expose students to law enforcement so that they can develop their skills if they're interested. This is a great opportunity, and thank you so much to Officer Bowers for helping lead the program. Um, this, er this Thursday, we have our Club Rush number two, and this is a great opportunity for students to get involved, find new passions, and make new friends. And we're excited to have over 60 clubs. Our sock hop is February 16th. This is open to all special need TBSD students, and this has been a huge hit in the past. We're super excited for our rich program. And with Valentine's Day coming up, ASB is so excited to have a kissing booth. Um, don't worry, it's Hershey Kisses, not actual ones. Um, <laughs> but students can enjoy a sweet treat during lunch and celebrate the holiday. Our girls lacrosse team is doing great in their season, and they just had a tournament last weekend and made it to the second round of playoffs. Great job, girls. And tomorrow during lunch, we have our national college signing. We have 12 students signing, and I'll be there to watch and support all of them, but especially my teammate, Bella Rittenberg, for committing to University of Pennsylvania. Our Puma students and staff are super excited to play in the dodgeball intramural starting February 8th, and we're expecting quite the turnout. Yes. And shout out to our Platinum Press um, for doing a great job. Their next issue is on Valentine's Day. And I can't wait to see what they have planned. Thank, Thank you, you, and have a Pumatastic day. <laughs> Thank you, Summer and Avery. Next, I welcome up Great Oak High School, uh, uh, Noel, and forgive me, Fogelin and Elisa Key, or Alicia Key. Did I pronounce it right? Hi everyone, we're so happy to be back for the 2023 school year. My name is Noah Boglin and I'm the senior school board representative. And my name is Alyssa Key, the junior school board representative. We cannot thank you enough for letting us share what has been going on at Great Oak at, oh, at Great Oak for January of 2023. This month we had our winter sports rally. The spirit days leading up to it were pajama day, Greek life, and neon day. The theme of the rally was neon. It was really beautiful and bright. The sports included girls water polo, boys and girls basketball, boys and girls soccer, wrestling, boys and girls cross country, and our unified team. There were also performances by Varsity Dance, Varsity Cheer, Ohana Nananui, Step, PSO Drumline. Every group wore neon outfits that lit up the room. It was a really nice time being able to recognize these different groups as well as teachers. Some teachers got to participate in a donut eating competition where they had to eat a donut while that was attached to a string without their hands. <laughs> Students played a life-size version of Hungry Hippos with neon balloons. We had such a fun time being surrounded by friends and being able to recognize some of the groups that make Great Oak so great. And then for our girls water polo, Varsity had their senior night and fortunately won their senior night. Um, and we'd also like to give a shout out to our very own senior, Trevor Shuck, for earning all CIF linebacker for football. Congratulations, Trevor. <laughs> um, on 120, uh, we had our silent seven game with a student turnout of over 600 students. We had a final score of 76 to 38. So, silent seven is a game held for our boys and girls varsity basketball game where we stay completely silent until the seventh point is scored. Up until that seventh point, we shake our hands every time they score a point. When they do achieve that seven point, all students and staff stand and cheer as loud as they can. We had amazing performances by cheer and dance. And congrats to the JV and varsity water polo to girls <laughs> to making it to league carousel finals. Good luck tomorrow. 
This month, our math club took part in a worldwide math competition. 300 teams participated, and we finished in sixth place in the world. We're extremely proud of them. We had our first FMP of the semester earlier in the month. FMP stands for Freshman Meeting Place. It's where our peer leaders go to freshman classes and interact with them. They talk about stress, school, and some common difficulties. The peer leaders give them advice, and they talk them through it. Um, they do this a couple of Fridays every month, and our freshmen are extremely grateful. We also had our freshman forum last week. And our freshman forum is a place where freshmen can listen to guest speakers talk about one of the words in our SPIRIT acronym. Dr. Lane was our guest speaker this month, and she Woo! talked to the freshmen. <laughs> <laughs> she talked to the freshmen about integrity. She went into some detail about struggles through her childhood and college. Thank you, Dr. Lane. <laughs> Thank you so much for having us, and we can't wait for what 2023 brings the Wolfpack this year. See you in February. Go, Go Wolfpack! Thanks, Noelle and Alisa. Next, recognizing Lena Maddox and Alicia Rodriguez from Temecula Valley Golden Bears High School. Good evening. We thank you all for the opportunity to share our excitement as we move past the new year. We are pumped to get into it and share everything that has been happening on our campus with all of you. Let's get into it. I'm Alicia. And I'm Lana. And starting us off, um, the last week was kind of crazy with everything going on. It was back to back to back events. Um, and the beginning of the week, we started off with our academic pins to, to any of our students who received a 3.0 GPA or higher in the fall semester. We we're so proud of our students and we were able to give away 1,900 of our academic pins. Um, we also were able to give away 250 improvement pins to any student who improved their GPA at least 0.5 from the other semester. Um, a special congratulations to those students on our campus and that accomplishment was just able to, ooh, was able to be turned around in just nine weeks. We also honored more than 820 students who made it onto the principal's honor roll by achieving a 4.0 or higher last semester. Whether students are there for the first time or they make it in for every semester, they enjoy the mini ceremony celebration, celebration honoring their hard work. And also last week, we were finally able to see all the practice and preparation of those involved in the senior directed play, A Doll's House. Haley Garcia and Millie Bailey directed this entirely student prepared production in our PAC the later half of the week. The play was unique from the other plays we have seen before. Next month, our freshmen, or future freshmen, will be visiting our campus for Cubs on Campus, and it's a perfect time for upcoming freshmen to prepare themselves for high school and what clubs, activities, and athletics they want to be a part of. Um, they also get tours of our beautiful campus. ASB has sent out our annual matchmaking questionnaire where we have the student body answer a few questions about themselves and we distribute results with who they're most or least compatible with. It's a fun way to bring students together. As winter athletics season ends soon, wrestling and soccer have been showing a lot of success. Our wrestling team placed third in Battle of the Belts um, tournament along with Matt Perez Diamond who finished second in his weight class. They clutched the league championships once again. Last night, girls soccer had their senior night and their final home game. They had a really good chance of making it to the CIS. On Friday, we also held an academic fair on our campus. We had student representatives give out their first-hand experience as part of dual enrollment, CTE, AP, VAPA, and many electives. We try to get students lots of information about the various course options before they pick their classes for next year. At our last student senate meeting, um, the group of students developed adulting workshops to help to be held during advisement. Based on their input, two weeks ago, we hosted an interviewing skills training for bears looking for part-time jobs. Student Senate is a monthly meeting where students can give their thoughts on what's happening on our campus. We wanted to invite some of our school board members to our next meeting in February or March to hear from, um, from our students. They would love the opportunity to share their feedback on our campus and those things and what they see going well and areas of improvement. The students take a lot of ownership in their school and they enjoy an opportunity to be a part of the process. The week before winter break, we had our open mic night. It was flourishing with tons of talent all night long. Open mic night gives an opportunity to our students to perform their talents on a smaller scale. Lana and I were the hosts, and it was incredible, incredible to get to meet all of the talent for a few minutes before they performed. We had bands, singers, comedians, and so much more. 
This Friday, we are hosting our Golden Buzzer Talent Show in the theater. There will be 18 students or groups showcasing their talents on stage. The show begins at 6.30 p.m. and the entrance is free. There will also be judges, just like America's Got Talent. I'm one of the judges, so you guys should all come and watch, and I guarantee it will be amazing. The TV talk show Winter Rally really felt like a Tonight Show episode and was a lot of fun. We introduced the winter sports and upcoming act activities for the semester. Baile Folklorico, Cheer, Alliance, and Ohana Maui performed. Students met our new principal, Ms. Leone, and inter interviewed our athletic captains and campus supervisors. Teachers also participated in a game of Spill Your Guts or Fill Your Guts, where they had to answer questions or eat disgusting food like spoons full of mayo. Last week, we also prepared our hearts with personalized messages for everyone on our campus. Our goal is to make everyone smile on our campus at least once that day. And this month, we have our fashion show, and we've been receiving donations of clothes in our clothing drive, which will be used for the outfits. Students participating in the show have the option of being a designer or a model, or even both if they want to. And once again, thank you for having us. I'm Lana. And I'm Alicia. And, and stay, stay golden. golden. Thank you, Lana and Alicia. Next up, we're going to recognize Mr. Edgar Diaz, Spotlight, TVEA. Come up, Mr. Diaz. Hey, thanks again for providing this opportunity for us to come and share. Good evening, members of the board and staff. I'm proud to represent TVEA with the Spotlight today. Uh, I've seen a lot of regular faces out here. Normally, if you were here years before, it was me and a few other people out in the the seats, so there's a lot of people out there. I see a lot of uh, some TBA officers out there and some site leaders and part of our membership as well. Uh, as our union, we continue to advocate for conditions for students to maximize learning conditions from the student spotlights. I believe you heard quite a bit from what's out there in developing that culture at sites. Uh, as educators, we work to create safe spaces for students so they can grow into confident, critical, adventurous thinkers and leaders. Uh, and it was just amazing because uh, I taught middle school and elementary. I'll give you my background if you haven't known too much about me. But I taught elementary for about 10, 12, I don't know how many years, and then taught middle school for another 10. Uh, and running into Great Oak, peop great, great Oak students here, because those are the schools that are students that my school feeds into, just seeing them and seeing how much they have grown in just one year. I was like, are you a junior? Like, no, I'm a freshman. Like, really? A freshman already? Just all the experiences they have. Uh, a lot of it, uh, I want to say, comes from, if you've been to school, school visits yet, you may notice that teachers provide learning environments so that students can grow within themselves, right? So they can take things and challenge it and play with it. Uh, if they are taking things that are rote memory, I'm not really going to gr grow a lot from that. Uh, I guess the saying was, I don't know, about years ago, was like, sage on the, don't be the sage on the stage. That's like old school education, but be the guide on the side that provides those opportunities so that people and students can grow. Uh, and if you notice from the student spotlights, our campuses empower students to create experiences and buy into that campus culture that brings them back all the time. Funny, <laughs> one of the students I ran into is like, I really liked your class, but I really liked high school so much more because there's so much more to do. <laughs> nothing, nothing personal about middle school. I was like, we know, we know middle school. <laughs> I'm sure you all remember middle school. Mm. Um, so I hope that your visits to learning environments at different schools display the breadth and depth of learning that educators provide to students on a daily basis. Uh, we provide general uh, education instruction with rigorous standards and engaging environments. We're supporting students academically, emotionally, and through the tribulations of, of growing up because sometimes problems just happen to come in to the classroom. But I didn't become an educator to read out lessons from a book or from a lesson plan that was provided for me. I, like my fellow educators, find my joy in the connections that help students realize what they have within them, enable them to follow a path that was previously undiscovered. Uh, whatever a student is in the midst of at home, our classrooms are a safe place to be themselves, wonder, question, uh, and grow as students and as individuals. Uh, you, see, you saw examples of this in every program, club and team, that the students highlight in the high school spotlights. Every program from um, the, in the high school that's there from like clubs, uh, from the decathlon to the teams to the CT there, that's all behind one educator that's put and invests a lot of time to make that grow and provide that environment for students. Uh, as a union, we work to advocate for environments that maximize learning potential, surrounding teachers with the right tools and attracting the top talent in the area. This year, we're sponsoring over 20 teachers 
uh, from brand new to the profession, like month six, to years 10 and 11. Uh, and that seems to be like areas that inspire people to grow, to add to their tool belt, to uh, get new teaching strategies, or to just go out and wonder. Because if you're out in, in the classroom environment many times, if you're working with 36, 30, or MP, even up to 60 students, that's not a lot of time for reflection. So just being have that time to be able to go out and think and see what else can I add to my classroom environment. That provides a lot of inspiration. Uh, the conferences that we're sending to them give them like day one activities that they can implement uh, the very next week they come back to campus. Um, before you today, you will have an MOU that allows educators to respectively retire and allow them to access uh, a bridge to Medicare. So I would appreciate your consideration on that. Uh, as people are retiring in their age, uh, if you notice there's like a teaching shortage because we have a, a large amount of people who are approaching retirement age in almost every single sector of our economy, uh, we are looking to make sure that people have that ability to be able to make that, make that move as easy as possible for them. Uh, we are also working with HRD to ensure that our compensation can attract CTE and SLP professionals to instruct and support our students. Uh, another exciting point is adding counselors and support to high school and middle school respectively. While we do not know yet what this will look like, it's an exciting prospect for us to gather, get together, and discuss what those options look like moving into the next year. Uh, what that will mean for support for students and what that will mean for supporting our professionals on the field. I'm also excited to recognize that we're moving close to an MOU to provide case management time for our elementary special education teachers. Uh, that's been exciting news. I have, there might have been some people here speaking to that topic, but that just came down today, so just wanted to let you guys know. That's kind of moving forward, and we are excited to have that. SDC teachers in elementary and everyone need that time to prepare tests and prepare IEPs to meet legal timelines. At the moment, secondary teachers have a case management period. Uh, elementary teachers did not. Um, and we're also, there's a lot of stuff going on right now. Uh, uh, the state through CDE passed a mandate to in, or be able to account for special education minutes for students who have IEPs. We are working with HRD as well to develop a protocol uh, that educators can implement. Uh, again, we don't know what that looks like yet. We're just initial discussion, but that's something that the district has to move forward on, and we are ready to work with them to make sure that our educators can implement that and we can document what we can have in a way that's respectful to people's days and their work responsibilities. Uh, I hope in your time, seated as a trustee of the TVSD board, you take time to visit us, uh, engage us in conversation. My appreciation to Ms. Uh, Mrs. Barclay and Mr. Schwartz for taking time this month to meet with me and to recognize how each employee, certificated or classified and admin, invests in this school district to live to its potential. Uh, good night. Thank you, Mr. Diaz. <laughs> CSA President uh, Andrew Enrique, he's out sick, so we hope you feel better soon, Andy. Uh, we'll bring up PTA Spotlight with Becca Mark Sanderson. Becca? Good evening. I am Becca Marks Anderson, current president of Temecula Valley Council of PTAs. I thank you for your time and consideration this evening. This year, PTA as a global organization will turn 126 years old. That is 126 years of perseverance, dedication, and unwavering focus on our primary objective as an organization, benefiting the lives of all children. Through the continued efforts and perseverance of our families, educators, and partners, we know that PTA will be here standing strong for another 126 years and beyond. We recognize that through our dedication and focus on our purpose, that we can continue to ensure that all students are successful, a goal that we have shared with Temecula Valley Unified School District for the last 31 years. For everyone here, if you have not already, I invite you to join a PTA of your choosing, elementary, middle, high school, pick one or more, so that you can see firsthand the collaboration, the energy, the dedication, and the work that these amazing families and staff members are doing to support our children however possible. They're building community relationships. This is what TVUSD is known for, and this collaboration and focus on children is what has historically garnered county, state, and even national recognition. TOTA makes joining easier than ever. You could join while I'm speaking tonight at the unit of your choice. The 2022-2023 Reflections Program Reception, hosted on December 19th, 
was our first district-wide in-person recognition since 2019. TVCPTA was proud to recognize student artists from the majority of TVUSD schools, announcing more than 20 student artists in six categories were advancing to the 23rd District PTA level, which is the Riverside County level of the program. Reflections is an opportunity for every child to express themselves exactly how they are, and a wonderful opportunity for TVUSD and TVCPTA in partnership to celebrate the sharing of each student's voice. The 2022-2023 Reflections theme is Show Your Voice, and it has been our honor and privilege to experience the talent our students have to offer. It is also our honor and privilege to be the host council for the 2022-2023-23rd District PTA, again, the Riverside County level, Reflection Showcase, currently scheduled for mid-March at the Temecula Valley High School Golden Bear Theater. This showcase will not only recognize artists who have advanced from units and councils all over the county, it will also recognize the artists selected to advance to the California State PTA level of the Reflections program. In the last 10 years of the Reflections program, eight of those years have seen Riverside County and 23rd District PTA artists advancing to receive re national recognition. For seven of those years, these extraordinary artists have been Temecula Valley Unified School District students. We invite you to join us in the hopes that this tradition of excellence continues and hard copy invitations will be delivered on your behalf to the Temecula Valley Unified School District offices. As I mentioned, PTA has a rich history of more than a century. Kindergarten, hot lunch programs, and even Teacher Appreciation Week have all evolved because of the work of PTA, of parents and family members, community members, teachers, staff, administrators, all who have come together to focus on what matters, ensuring that every child has an opportunity to shine. We are now looking toward Founders Day a celebration and recognition of these individuals who embody the spirit of PTA and that same dedication, spirit, and tremendous heart that inspired Phoebe Apperson Hurst and Alice McClellan Burney in 1897. That same heart that has evolved to become PTA today. As we encourage units to recognize and share those individuals who have the heart for service and keep the focus on children, we at Council look forward to recognizing three outstanding individuals amongst those presented to us who truly represent the best of PTA, and we will name our scholarships for graduating seniors in their honor. We invite you to join us for the Founders Day reception on Thursday, March 9th, an event that highlights the long-standing partnerships of PTA with both TVUSD and the City of Temecula, all of whom have contributed to our students' renowned successes. Hard copy invitations will be delivered on your behalf to the Temecula Valley Unified School District offices. And as we look forward to our elections for the coming year, both for our councils and units, it is a very exciting time. And we will, do, we will do our best to ensure that the excellence for which Temecula Valley Unified School District and PTA have been renowned continues to be the case in the Temecula Valley. Whatever next year looks like, we are here to support our students however possible continuing our long-standing tradition of excellence in association with Temecula Valley School District and its schools. We are here to support every child. And as I close this evening, you are always welcome to reach out to me if you have any questions. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you, Mrs. Mark Sanderson. So now we'll move on to public comments. The governing board welcomes public comments. This is the time for open session public comments. Public comments are allowed up to a maximum of three minutes per comment in the order received to a maximum of 30 minutes per item for comments on agenda items or non-agenda items. For consent agenda items topics, a list of three minutes will be allowed from one speaker unless the item has been placed on the published agenda in accordance with the Brown Act. There shall be no action taken. No discussion will be made regarding personnel uh, issues in open session. All public comments are an important part of the board meeting and are given careful consideration by the governing board. Are there any remaining public comments on any agendized items this evening and which items?
Please give me a second while I count these. So I'm open for the 30 minutes to, um, allotted for public comments. Um, best case scenario, opening this up for discussion, we can allow two minutes per speaker. Would that be to ensure that 20, we hear from everyone? 22 uh, speakers at three minutes apiece, that's, that's over an hour. Plus we have other speakers that are even more than 22. Do you know how many on the agenda item? The county? I'm here, I'm fine for three minutes each. Okay. This is, this is a really heavy meeting. There's already quite a bit that we have to go through. So I just, I wanna be thoughtful about the staff's time. Um, we're probably gonna be here very late. Um, okay. Two, I'll do 30 minutes at two minutes apiece or three minutes apiece. And it's going to cut out 12 if we do three minutes apiece. So you don't want to extend the time? That's why we're having a discussion. I heard Mr. Gonzalez, I tend to agree. We have a long night, plus we have other agenda items. Let's just stick three minutes apiece, 30 minutes. Mm. That, I mean, so we're cutting out more than half of the comments? We're going to give the allotted 30 minutes time. They're bylaws. And this is just for public comments. We so there's more. 12 we won't hear unless we cut it to two minutes, right? Or we extend the time for 30 minutes. I understand a, it's a long night, but I think a lot of people have made time, and and I do apologize to the cabinet and the staff. I know that it is a really long day, but I just feel like if they've come and it's 30 minutes, it's not three hours, so that that would be my opinion, to go ahead and hear from everybody. Okay, and I'll bring so you guys I, cookies tomorrow. Can you hear me? Yeah, Mr. Can Schultz, we can hear you. Go ahead, Mr. Schwartz. Uh, why don't we just cut it to two minutes and let everyone speak? I could go with two minutes. Have everybody speak two minutes. That way Pick everyone has points. a chance to speak. Yeah, I, I would rather do that than cut out comments. All right, that's what we're doing. Two minutes apiece. We are going to honor the people in order, and let's just make sure, yes, they're in order. Our first speaker is Kimberly De La Cruz. I just want to say before I start that a lot of people prepare for three minutes and so they time their their comments on that so in preparing to speak tonight I wasn't sure how to begin I've been attending board meetings for a very long time and I've never experienced anything like the last special board meeting that was held I believe mr. Gonzalez referred to it as a clown factory which I would agree at the January 18th meeting I heard a lot of talk from some of the board members about the student walkouts and the disruption it created I'd like to remind the board that by calling a special meeting, you yourselves cause disruptions. Believe it or not, this room is not only used for board meetings, it is used to conduct school business, meetings, and trainings during the day. That day on January 18th, the board disrupted employees and the important work that they do by interrupting the use of this room to have it set up for an unnecessary board meeting. I also heard about how some board members were using the walkouts 
uh, and their concerns for safety as a reason to call that meeting. Amongst other comments, Mrs. Wiersma stated that campus security supervisors were concerned with the protocol of unlocking gates for the walkout. I've been on the TBEA grievance committee for many years and safety is also is always an issue we are addressing. Mrs. Wiersma, is it safe to have doors locked where students and staff cannot get out? Clearly you are uninformed and unaware of the run, hide, a fight training personnel have received. Also as part of the grievance committee, we have been working with the district to ensure that gates have push bars or are able to lock to keep people off campus, but unlocked from the inside so people can run and leave if needed. If there is any school, any school in this district where gates are locked and people cannot freely leave, I want and need to know about this. So if you're at one of those schools that you cannot get out, please contact me. 30 seconds. Lastly, there were statements about the reasoning for the closed session items conference regarding personnel matters. Again, this caused disruption amongst employees and created a chaotic storm. Teacher and staff's focus should be on the students, not on speculation, rumors, or the unknown related to personal matters, matters during their workday. To sum up, I'd like to say that before making statements about walkouts being disruptive and safety issues, some of the board members should consider their own behaviors and actions and reflect on the chaos they created by calling a special board meeting. Oh, and Dr. In time. All right, our next speaker is Joshua Moore. Let me know when. <laughs> now that I begin the speech, I just want to get straight to the point. How is a district, how is a community, how are we as a people supposed to allow a leader like Jen Wearsman to dictate what is factored into our education system and what isn't? Her explanation for the removal of the CRTs, what is it made? White students feel uncomfortable and that it was deemed unnecessary. And at the most recent unjust emergency meeting, she preached the safety of her district. As a student who has attended Chaparral High School, I've attended school with Jen's child. And in my experience attending school with him, I've received nothing but hatred and degradation from him. Jen's son and his friends on campus have openly hate crimed me and threatened me on campus. They have followed me to my car calling me a faggot. They have pranked called me calling me a faggot. He and his friends have openly stated that they hate me because I'm gay and have done overall nothing but hate me and harass me for my sexuality. Not only does he harass myself, but he has made comments about people of color, calling them dirty, and he even calls them racial slurs. I just wanted to ask Jen, how are you as a person raising such a hateful child and preaching safety upon our district? Because if your child leaves home comfortable with that mindset, it leads me to wonder how he, where he learned it from. I hate, hate starts from home, and you out of all people are going to preach safety. You yourself are raising a child who creates, uh, creates these feelings of unsafetyness. I should be going to school without worrying that I'll be hate crime that day. I should be comfortable speaking today without worrying of the backlash I will receive from your child and his friends. I will, sorry, I should and all students should feel comfortable at school. So if you're going to preach about safety, you should reflect upon yourself and hold yourself accountable for allowing such hatred to bloom within your home and within our district. This leads me to find it absolutely disgusting for you out of all people to have the privilege to dictate and filter on the inclusion of people of color in their history and our education. You have already failed you to properly educate your seconds. own. Okay, girl. You have already failed to properly educate your child on the inclusion and acceptance of the other, and you are failing us as a district to, uh, to a rightful education, sheltering our children from any children, and this from the CRT and unblatant, blatant, unfiltered history, the matter continues, ignorance and situations that I've experienced, holding back others from learning about other peers' backgrounds and open discussions about different identities and pure history, whether it be African Americans, Mexicans, Afghans, Asians, or gay people, it forces students to feel ashamed of what makes this difference. It closes off the opportunity to have these discussions and allows disgusting hatred like yours and your Time. Krista Moore, I'd ask you to be respectful when you address board members. That's Mrs. Wiersma, not girl. Thank you. He can say whatever he wants. Hey, yeah. Yeah. He can say what he wants. Our next speaker is Cindy Hurley. No matter how you condescendingly spin it, additional legal counsel comes out of the general fund. 
meaning there will be less money for classrooms, programs, and students. I'm here to talk about $620 an hour and this ream of paper. This ream of paper represents copies. As a teacher, we are excited when PTA can pay for copies. If we're talking about going back to basics, do you want the kids to write on slates with basic supplies? $620 an hour. This ream represents the amount of copies the law firm can build us, uh, bill us. $620 an hour, this ream represents the weapon that I have available in my classroom as an intruder comes in. This could pay for safety blinds, gates, doors, and blinds for our doors to protect our students. This ream represents the paperwork our overworked special education teachers are doing and trying to teach at the same time. The money could be used for pay for substitutes to relieve them. This ream represents paper that students can use in after school math lab, um, tutoring programs, enrichment programs. $620 could be used for staffing. When I was president of the Peace, uh, Parents Softball Association, parents needed to raise thousands of dollars. I'm sure this was and is the case for all sports, extracurricular, and academic groups. $620 an hour. If this firm was present at the first board meeting, it's conservative to say that it would cost the taxpayers $10,000. The list goes on. I highly question the need for our board to have legal counsel. In its history, seconds. TVOSD has never needed this added expense. Do not claim to be about safety, transparency, back to basics, and fiscal risk, uh, responsibility while asking the community to write a blank check to, check to a law firm that does not specialize in education. It doesn't matter if you try to spin it with a smile. The public is smarter than that. And even if you support these candidates, I recognize this is not fiscally responsible. It's stealing from our students. All right, our next speaker is Ben Richards. Good evening, everybody. I'm Ben. Boy, do we have some hateful people and some raucous people in this crowd. We're all having, excuse me, we're all having a nice evening, and we want to do our civic duty, okay? We all need to get along. But make no mistake, we are in a great conflict of our time, aren't we? Because no matter how reasonable a parent like me is, these people are going to continue coming up here and being hateful to our board members. And, well, gee, it sure does make sense because we have Mr. Schwartz who riles everybody up. I know you're not here, sir. But look, there's a lot of things we don't agree on. CRT, LGBTQ+, that's okay. But we don't need to be speaking to each other like you all are speaking to each other right now, okay? Look, we all got to get along here. Me personally, I don't want that stuff in my kids' schools. In my school, this school is just as much my school as your school. So the people have spoken. Now, we can all have activism and we can have free speech, but we don't need to be disrespecting people up, up here and calling people girl. It's not nice. Now... We need leaders here. We need leaders. We're going to be courageous. 30 seconds. We're going to be righteous and stand up and do the right thing and defend all the parents here, including parents like me. But we need leaders who are going to understand that there are some people here that no matter what you do and what you say, they're going to hate you. So I'm calling for an end to that, and let's bring it down a notch. This is my first address because I have another one coming up on the agenda item. Thank you all. Thank you. Okay? Get down a notch, man. Our next speaker is Tom Hayes. Some of you may remember me from the last time, well, not the last time that uh, we spoke, but... I did speak to the other board members when uh, we were going through the illegal mask mandates and uh, COVID and the, uh, the uh, what do you call it, the scamdemic, all that stuff that was going on. I believe you remember me from that, uh, Danny. I spoke at that meeting. I warned everyone here to study your history and learn what, what you learn what you could from your history. 
because we're bound to repeat it. I told you that you should be careful because of what happened in the Nuremberg, the Nuremberg trials of human testing, of testing against people's wills, of, of, all, of all that stuff. I talked to you about the Geneva Convention, breaking, breaking the Geneva, how it violates the Geneva, Geneva Convention. I warned you that if you held those, those uh, policies, that you too could be held liable and responsible. But what I want to talk about is the unscheduled field trip that took place on January 13th at three of our high schools. If it was a field trip, those should be planned and budgeted for. If you're saying that it's free speech, that's fine, it's free speech. But those students are not allowed to leave campus. Those students are supposed to be on campus. 30 if seconds. not, they're supposed to be truant. If they are not truant, then what were they? Since they were truant, where was the sheriff's department issuing citations? Think about the, the uh, strain that it added to, to uh, campus. So what about the uh, campus police? Did they attend? Who was guarding the students that remained behind? No one. So you want to talk about security. And time. All right, our next speaker is John Montrell. Hi, I just wanted to come before you guys as a, as a, uh, a concerned father and a man who grew up in this valley uh, his whole life. Um, I just see this whole thing as it's, it's just it's just dividing us, you know, and um, and we need to we need to look at that, you know, as a, you know, as you know, as a society and 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 see what we could do, you know, to bring each other together. I think that CRT is divisive. Um, and it's because it it labels it labels one group as, as oppressors and it labels other other people as oppressed. And, and that's just that's just the way it is. That's just what I see, you know. And and so that's why I'm sitting here right now. You know, our children are the future, and they don't need to be. They don't need to have that indoctrination going on in this in the schools, okay? And if we, you know, as the taxpayer of the constituents come before and they and they they want to nominate somebody here who is going to you know, work on that ground that they were gonna get rid of that, then we should, we need to just leave that alone and we need to just move forward, okay? Um, at that point, you know, if you guys wanna come back and, and, and change that, you know, when it's time, you know, just let the democratic process speak for itself. Um, and that's, that's what makes our country great, you know? Um, so, you know, that's, that's just, that's pretty much all I got to say, but thank you guys. Our next speaker is Jennifer Reeves. Members of the board, you claim the safety of all students is a top priority for you. Yet it would appear that your priority would be to silence the students from speaking out against something you did that is impacting them and their ability to learn accurate and honest history. There is a local man that spends every single day outside of the schools harassing the students with his sandwich board signs and bullhorn. But not once have you said anything about this man and his treatment of the students. Is this perhaps because the man in question campaigned for you and the position that you currently hold? What other reason is there to ignore the bullhorn used by a grown man to harass students, but n while actively going against students using the same item for their First Amendment rights to stand up against you and the tyranny you're pushing against them? I can understand that you do not dis like disagreements and negativity. Unfortunately, that comes with the territory of being on the school board. If you cannot handle people letting you know when they disagree with you and the decisions that you make that directly affect them, then perhaps this position is not the right one for you. Ms. Wiersma, at the last meeting, you made a statement that you do not feel supported in your position on the board. Please know that this is not personal, but when you choose to steamroll 
the items onto your, your constituents, you're not going to feel the support that you need. This isn't working. Thank you. All right, our next speaker is Jennifer San Nicholas. Good evening, my name is Jennifer San Nicholas and I am an involved TVUSD parent of two boys. I've had the pleasure of meeting Allison and Steven in the past, but I wanted to introduce myself to the new members. I have been a TVUSD parent since February 2011 when my then three-year-old autistic son started at Jackson Preschool the day after his birthday. From there, we went to TES, MMS, and CHS. When I call myself an involved parent, it is because I served on LCAP and CAP committees and have been involved in PTA at every level, from elementary school, middle school, and even served on the executive board of TVC PTA. I have attended SILPA meetings and trainings and sat on boards of local nonprofits. I have been recognized by Assemblywoman Marie Waldron and State Senator Jeff Stone for my volunteer work and contributing to the betterment of education. I have put on major family engagement events promoting literacy, art, STEM, and even dressing up as Mrs. Frizzle a few times for Read Across America Day. <laughs> and I've been to almost every Spirit Day and Flag Assembly. I still get hugs at the grocery store from some of my Tiger alumni at, from TES. In the community, I have the honor of being the chair for the inaugural Walk in the Vines for Autism and on the Planning Commission for San Diego Walk Now for Autism Speaks. I was on campus so much that students at TES thought I worked there. I was there on November 9th, 2016, when a couple of students burst into the PTA room crying because they thought the new president-elect was going to deport their families. I was also at CHS on November 9th of last year when one of those students, since coming out as queer, fell into my arms in tears because of this election, a local one. They feared seconds. the possibility of newly elected members would result in expulsion and ridicule, othering and leaving out students without a safe space. I let them know it would happen over my dead body. I am not here to toot my own horn. I know plenty of parents who do as much, if not more, than I do. I am here because I know what is expected of a school board, what accountability is and what it should look like, and I know what parent involvement is and what it should look like. Most importantly, I am here today because I'm using my privilege as a white Christian wife of a deputy sheriff and mother of two children to advocate for all students who feel marginalized. And time. Our next speaker is Diane Cox. Good evening, school board, cabinet members, and superintendent Dr. McClay. I'm Diane Cox. Um, this is my 25th year as an education specialist at Chaparral High School. I've been married to a retired Marine for 36 years and have two adult children who received a stellar education from this district. They were taught to think critically and draw their own conclusions when presented with a variety of viewpoints. As black scholars in a majority white space, it wasn't always easy for them to be their true authentic selves on campus. And quite frankly, it hasn't always been easy for me either. At the December board meeting, you prefaced a re resolution that you put forth with an all too familiar quote from Dr. Martin Luther King's 1963, I Have a Dream speech. Dr. King said in an interview later in 1967, and I quote, I must confess that the dream that I had that day has in many points turned into a nightmare. I've dedicated my 35 years, my 35 year teaching career to inspiring all students the desire for learning, giving the voice to the voiceless and the underserved. Like Dr. King, I fear that, okay, that's not gonna bother me. Uh, like, I can read in the dark. Can you stop my time? Because I really can't see. I feel like a ref in a football match. We're going to add 10 seconds to the time. Whew. Okay. I must confess that the dream that, well, anyway, I've dedicated my 35-year teaching career to inspiring all students to desire for learning, giving them a voice to the voiceless and the underserved. Like Dr. King, I feel that the resolution put forth by the new school board members and the way students have been treated for wanting to be heard has become a nightmare. 30 seconds. The resolution is so vague that when I want to tell my story about how I grew up in the rural South with my parents as sharecroppers, I have to question 
question. Is this a part of the so-called other, other frameworks? What does that mean? You know, um, I would wager that this res resolution is more about the very ambiguous umbrella that's being used to go after programs and curriculums that don't deem appropriate for public education. Time, thank you. Time. Okay, your time's up. Time. Please respect the two minutes. All right, our next speaker is Steve Campos. Okay, I would like to discuss a few concerns that have recently uh, were spoken at uh, some of the last two board meetings. The first was Rob Claus's information that he shared in regards to the mishandling of the closing of the TVUSD charter school in the past. That may not have been, that may not have been handled in a transparent or unbiased way and instead seemed more like a biased internal affairs investigation instead. <clears throat> the second was Sherry Franklin's recent concerns expressed about following the rules. All rules need to be followed and not just the ones they want to follow, especially by administrative leadership. Sherry brought up some great examples of admin and school board members not following the rules. On top of that, some of them showed great unprofessionalism at our first school board meeting. I also wanted to add another example. At some football games last season, our superintendent was seen taking photos with four to five members of the previous board, and yet no one was concerned about the Brown Act being violated. My question is why not? How do we know what topics of conversation were being had at those football games? As a matter of fact, those photos were posted on school board candidates' social media as part of their campaigning efforts. Finally, I have also been involved in a few investigations that seemed very biased, retaliatory, harassing, and completely uncalled for. As a matter of fact, one of them still continues today, and I'll be uh, emailing you guys that as well. Um, Part of that is I made some comments here publicly and in September of 2021 as well as in October. Um, I go on to speak out. I file a complaint with a few others about the mask mandates. 30 seconds. Next thing I know, um, I'm being called in by Mr. Arce for some things that I had mentioned publicly. Anyways, um, that being said, my hopes is that we do, is that we do have our, our will or legal counsel that will follow the rules and ensure that everyone is properly doing their job and that there is no bias. The goal should always be to ensure that we are in compliance with Ed Code and state law. My hopes is that someone can review Rob's, Sherry's, and my concerns to ensure that our situations or concerns have been handled professionally, appropriately. Time. Our next speaker is Bob Quaid. Hi, my name is Bob Quaid, and yes, I'm still traumatized by my, my middle school experience. <laughs> but I can say that high school turned me around, senior class president, captain of the wrestling team. So for all of you that are still traumatized by middle school, young, you young people, high school rules. Okay, um, well, you know my name. My wife and I, uh, Laura, have been members of this Temecula community for almost 20 years. And although we no longer have uh, students uh, children of student age, we are still invested in the local schools through our property taxes. And we are very proud of the school district that this Temeca Valley School District ranks number 20, uh, is 20 in the top 20% of California. But after hearing tonight and watching some of the videos, I'm totally discouraged to see what, how our students are, are respecting authority, the lack of, of respect for time, that woman who was just up here and to, kept talking when her time was up, Okay, if that's, the, if that's what our teachers are teaching our students, to be disrespectful to authority, to not follow the rules, we have a, big, we have a bigger problem than CRT. Yes. Okay, so. Yes, so anyways, I just want to finish up with regard to CRT. 
We have already seen videos and heard reports of the progressive poison creeping into our classrooms despite, the, dis, but despite denials by teachers and students. If CRT is not being taught, then why is there so much outcry over banning it? 30 seconds. Here, here. Their protest betrays their denial. Or is the real threat that the, uh, the recent board action is, a cert to, is causing certain educators to lose their power to further indoctrinate and convert students to the religious left? That's why the voters of this district have elected three new board members so that we can make the statement, not in our backyard, not in our schools, not to our, well, our children. Time, thank you. Our next speaker is Mike Brewer. Excuse my voice. In the short span of fewer than three months, several members of our new board have alienated members of our student body, caused widespread confusion and panic among staff, and thrust our community into a national spotlight by hastily passing two action items that were never even discussed with the most important part of our district, our students. You first, your first and foremost promise is written clearly in the board bylaws, and I quote, board members shall hold the education of students above any partisan, principle, group interest, or personal interest. Yet it seems clear that your decisions have been entirely contrary to this purpose. Tonight, you bring a request to hire outside counsel to help you with unique circumstances and emergency situations. I'm sure you're aware of the school board bylaws that must be followed not just by this one, when it says the superintendent shall initiate a request for proposals to advertise and solicit proposals for legal services. It starts with a request from the superintendent and then goes through an exhaustive evaluation process where the firm's background, experience, reputation, key educational law, something this firm does not specialize in, will be considered. <clears throat> However, none of us know what the emergency or unique issues are including members of this board. Where is the transparency? You're okay with a firm being able to raise our rate whenever it pleases? Can you say write me a blank check? How about the lawsuit filed by Mr. Brenner seconds. on behalf of the Orange County School Board against the Orange County Superintendent over almost an identical move as we have tonight? A case that was thrown out and still netted Mr. Brenner $1.3 million in attorney's fees. I'm sure you're aware that this firm charges $620 an hour, which is double what we currently pay, and 200 more than any district in the Valley or surrounding area. How is this fiscally responsible? This is about certain members of the board trying to protect themselves, not the district. Time, thank you. Our next speaker is Jenny Schwarf. Sharp. Sorry if I mispronounced that. Good evening. I'm here to ask that both the board president, Joseph Komorowski, and his sidekick, Jen Wiersma, resign effective immediately. In their tenure as school board trustees, they've managed to have what were likely the longest and shortest TVUSD school board meetings. In one meeting, even though they're supposed to represent the community, they ignored the pleas of students and parents. In the other, the last meeting, or clown factory, they cannot even get an agenda passed, and their lack of transparency created an uproar in the community, wasting everyone's time and effort. It was blatantly obvious to all who watched that the school board president had every intention of speaking to the new lawyers he wants to hire at twice the cost of our current council about firing Dr. McClay. She's the only employee the board can fire and replace in the agenda stated personal matters appointment. Stop gaslighting your constituents by calling these facts rumors. In the CRT resolution, they shove down the throats of TVUSD educators and students. It states that we are not allowed to teach that individuals are either a member of the oppressor class or the oppressed class because of race or sex. Yet, school board president, a white male, has repeatedly shown that he is in fact using his newfound position of power to oppress those with less power, TVUSD's students. He continues to oppress freedom of thought and expression in our classrooms with his needless re re resolution and makes people stand out in the cold instead of second-class citizen vaccinated people just got to get on with their lives 
But oh, you unvaccinated, you go test every week or you're fired. I feel like I got a tiny glimpse into the life of Rosa Parks, <laughs> who had to sit in the back of the bus because of the color of her skin. And because of my medical choice, I was subjected to this treatment. Week after week after week, it just got depressing. The founders of our country didn't think that it was needed, included in our Constitution. The founders of our country didn't think it was needed seconds. to include in our Constitution the right to medical freedom, but apparently they were wrong. I just want you to know that it's very difficult to drive the bus from the back of the bus. So again, I'm asking for your help that you would say no to any future medical mandates, that we here in Temecula could be a great example to our students of how an America First school district operates, that each individual has the freedom to make the medical choices that are right for them, and that we get to live and work as free Americans. Thank you. If we're not respectful and the crowd roars, this is the first warning. The next warning, we're going to be forced to clear the auditorium and we'll conduct school business. Please be respectful of comments for and against your position. This goes for everyone. This goes for everyone. That's the last time I'm going to warn the crowd. Our next speaker is Elizabeth Craig. board members. I'm a parent in the Temecula School District with um, an elementary school aged child who is autistic. It has recently come to my attention that at Tony Tobin Elementary, the new principal, Mr. Graniel, has took it upon himself to hold a staff meeting where he asked the teachers to be sure they were discussing with their students about LGBTQ. He also disclosed during this meeting that he would be putting up an LGBTQ flag in the office. While I'm a firm believer in adults choosing their own path and having the freedom to do so, I do not, however, want their sexual preference discussed with my child. My question to you is, if we can put up an LGBTQ flag to be more inclusive, then why not an autism acceptance flag or an epilepsy awareness flag? Is Mr. Graniel encouraging the teachers to discuss autism with their students? Because that makes kids different. In a recent study, they found that one in 10 autistic people will attempt suicide. And of those, one in five autistic girls will attempt suicide. If we are worried about the students' mental health and feeling included, then why are we not worried about all of the students? The American flag represents all of the students in our school and is the reason it is appropriate in all of the classrooms and offices. I implore you to think hard about this kind of inclusivity that, and the device, divisiveness it creates. Furthermore, the next time the school district seconds. informs about Pride Month in June and has neglected to inform about Autism Acceptance Month in April, I would like you to think long and hard about the message that, the, that is clearly being taught. We accept those who are different, but not that different. I, ref I respectfully request that you remind Mr. Graniel that it is very important to ensure every child is represented and included, or give him a massive wall to put every single person's flag on. Our next speaker is Christine Massa. I'd like to start by saying that the walkouts conducted by students a few weeks ago were extremely safe, despite what you may think, a few of you. With the exception of some counter protesters throwing food at them and unrelated adults harassing them. But many more adults came out and supported them and made sure that our students were safe. But let me tell you about some times when our kids didn't feel safe, that you don't seem to think are problematic. Like at the height of the pandemic, every time my kids had to sit next to a kid in class who wore their mask down around their chin, they felt unsafe or when visiting schools primarily black cheerleaders were taunted with racial slurs at a TVHS football game. I'm sure they felt unsafe. Tell me how we don't need more race education. Or when an adult with an anti-LGBTQ sign hangs out in your campuses with a bullhorn and harasses our students. 
How is that not dangerous? Mrs. Rearsma, why doesn't that make it on your TVUSD Instagram, which you keep saying isn't your TVUSD Instagram? Why is he entitled to more free speech than our students? Is it because he campaigned for you? And every time there's a school shooting, my kids feel unsafe. What are you doing about gun violence? I know at least one of you, who I used to be friends with on social media, Jen, is a big gun rights supporter, and there were pictures of you in your personal Facebook about your love of guns and the NRA. But students exercising their First Amendment rights to free speech is not a dangerous situation. Remember, they were protesting a situation you created. That's called baiting, and really paints you as the dangerous Mr. Mr. Kramoski and Mrs. Wiersma. And by seconds. the way, I think a flag for the neurodivergent next to the pride flag would be awesome. Thank you. Our next speaker is Aaron Cook. I'm the father of a 13-year-old child as of yesterday has been disenrolled from TMS because of chicken pox. Um, all his shots have been received and in the chicken pox section of his form it says there is a had disease and it's been checked by his doctor in the place of a second shot. The first school letter we received said he would not go to get a class schedule in 22 citing they excluded personal beliefs from list of exemptions. We visited a pediatrician, she assured us that had disease portion of his card covered this and he was not in need of a second shot. His pediatrician went on to explain if he was a reactor the first time he would get chicken pox virus again, which he was. We spoke to the school nurse about the situation and she was provided a copy of his immunization record and our son was provided a schedule for the year. The only option for exemption was through a state program that handles this called CARE. Doctors feel this is a site that is to keep them quiet and they're only allowed a handful of submissions or they're to be investigated and potentially lose their practice and or license. Yesterday morning, I received a phone call stating that there was uh, from the school and asking if our son had received the second chickenpox shot. I truthfully answered no, to which they responded, well, your son doesn't need to come to school today. There are no signs that there's a pandemic of chickenpox ravaging schools or communities. Our son has a medical reason and he has every other shot required. The school will not even offer him online courses. Under current California law, they clearly lay out their plan to penalize doctors and schools for various vaccination requirements that the state of California determine. They clearly state they'll include vaccination rates seconds. as part of their annual financial audits, mixing money and medicine. For me, the damage is already done. My son has been disenrolled by these actions. The amount of stress and disappointment this has cost our family is immeasurable, and this only feels like the beginning. Our next speaker is Christopher Bout. Good evening, President Komorowski, Board of Trustees, Superintendent McClay, and staff. Uh, firstly, oh, I, I'm a parent of uh, two students, um, one at Tony Tobin, one at Vail Ranch Middle School, resident here in Temecula for 23 years. Uh, firstly, I, I just want to implore you guys to disregard all the hate that's coming your way. You guys are doing a fabulous job, and I applaud your strength, your courage, and your guidance, and I have utmost respect for you guys. And you, you know what? I, I honestly believe, believe the clown factory is right here. But uh, um, anyhow, as a parent, I fully support uh, Trustee Wiersma, um, action to retain neutral third-party counsel to investigate the issues relating to overall campus security. Please move forward with that. I mean, if, I, I, I know that a lot of people are, are citing uh, fiscal issues, but I, I think it could probably be paid for uh, through Jody McClay's salary. <laughs> the recent student walkouts that I wanted to talk to, uh, to you guys about were executed in a manner that placed student safety at risk, violated the physical security of the campuses, disturbed the learning environment, and were in violation of Ed Code 3210. Right. So, and that's a fact. And it rests on somebody's shoulders that's sitting seconds. up here. And um, so these facts, especially the flagrant Ed Code violation, constitute a severe dereliction of duty on the part of the participating school principals 
any and all administrators who are in the know, including Superintendent McClay, on whose shoulders this gross mo misconduct should fall. Superintendent McClay, I believe you have committed gross dereliction of duty and not capable to serve in the position that you currently hold. Thank you. We're gonna take a five minute recess. Okay, moving on to our next speaker, Greg Langworthy. Uh, my name is Greg Langworthy. <clears throat> I'm out at Calvary Chapel Bible Fellowship out in the wine country, and I've been witnessing the contentious debate, but I don't think this is necessarily a bad thing. Our Constitution provides us the opportunity, students, parents, the board, <clears throat> um, faculty to express their thoughts because of our constitutional principle that we're all created in God's image, and therefore we're all equally deserving of respect and to be listened to the challenge we can see is to engage in civil debate about a contentious issue. And that means attacking the argument rather than the person. That's not always easy. <clears throat> Two uh, proverbs I think are helpful. Proverbs 18, 17. One side seems right till another comes forward to question him. So that's how debate can make you smarter because you hear something you haven't heard before. And then Proverbs 27, 17 is iron sharpens iron. So a man sharpens his brother. So we get sharper in our arguments and smarter as we hear both sides of an issue. So I think this can be a, a learning experience for our students also. Students need to learn how to disagree agreeably, come to an agreement even though they start at different places. And I think we can be an example of what civil debate looks like and what compromise looks like through discussion. And so I want to encourage the board maybe to develop a forum where students and parents seconds. and faculty <clears throat> can engage in a non-emotional or less emotional debate where they can discuss these issues. Thank you very much. Samaya Robinson. Samaya. Samaya, sorry. Come on up. Go, girl. Good evening to everyone in and out of the room today. I'm Samaya Robinson, a senior at Great Oak High School and a board member of Great Oak BSU. I would like to first address the walkouts that have been happening in the last month with all the high schools. All the walkouts are student-led, no teacher involvement other than supervisions. All walkouts have been peaceful, nonviolent, or disrupted, like some think. As far as putting safety in place for these protests, there is already safety in place by multiple different things, such as our district walkout protocols and our own US Constitution. Banning books and teaching about black history is detrimental to our student body's understanding of the word, world of this country. And the fact that you are targeting black students in black history shows that your intentions and mindset is not about the students or their well-being. Not all of your students are white, but you still are protecting them, but protecting them from what? The true far country was built on the idea of freedom, but the dream never came true. Just since gendered white men, this is what our country was built on. That is the truth and what needs to be taught. The CRT you speak of has never been taught. No white kid is being told they are born racist, especially by teachers. They are only being taught the tragedies of history and the oppression of black, indigenous, Asian, and LGBTQ plus people. History is supposed to be uncomfortable for everyone. History is not political. If you are racing, you are a racist. If, you, if we can't talk and learn from our mistakes, then how can we move on to a true united and free country? All history is important, not just white Eurocentric history. 
please let the student listen to the students when we speak. We are not less knowledgeable or naive. We are here, we are experiencing this every day. Parents and boards do not live and hear what we hear. We are supported for who we are and should be taught all history. It is our right and what we Time. Our next speaker is Emil Barham. Emil? 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 Barham? And we have two speakers left until we get to the uh, board business, so last two. Hello there. I'm new to this community. Mm. I don't have any kids in this uh, going to school here. I don't know any teachers, um, but I'm late to this game. I don't know how I, um, I actually came upon the press releases of the walkouts and uh, I watched the board meeting videos. And uh, the common theme from these students is that they are not being allowed the opportunity through the passing of this resolution to be told their complete and true history. I'm a retired math and history teacher, high school. I taught at Cal State Long Beach in the teacher education departments in both math and history. And I wanna tell these students that there was a man who spoke at the December 13th meeting. His name was JP. I don't know where he teaches, but he had the most deductive, logical explanation of what is really true here in regard to your history. If you go back, and I would challenge you board members and Madam Superintendent to get these kids together and put the standards up and let them see that they are being taught in the fifth, the eighth, and the 11th grades about Indian conflicts, slavery, 30 the, seconds. the ramifications of slavery, reconstruction, Jim Crow laws, the opportunity to talk about social problems and connect them to the past. Um, you guys need to get together. This would be a good exercise for all of you to get these kids together with content leaders at these high schools and show them that what they are coming up here and saying. Time. Our next speaker is Jack Roundlute. Sorry, I didn't get that right. Roundlute. Jack. Great weather. <laughs> oh, one second. My notes weren't loading. Hi everyone, I'm Jack Bunletai and I am a student at Chaparral High School and I'm also um, one of the co-leaders of our Gender and Sexualities Alliance. Um, like many of my peers, I'm taking and planning on taking college level AP classes so I can afford to go to a university one day. College board has stated that they will revoke the AP status from classes and try that try and censor their content. From the official college board website, AP students are not required to feel certain ways about themselves or the course content. AP courses instead develop students' abilities to access the credibility of sources, draw conclusions, and make up their own mind. And AP courses foster an open-minded approach to the histories and cultures of different people. Um, students are encouraged to evaluate arguments, but not one another. AP classrooms respect diversity in background, experiences, and viewpoints. 
respect, full debate of ideas is cultivated and protected. Personal attacks have no place in AP. Now, I've been looking forward to take AP nec Lit next year because the class has a reputation for being one of the best taught classes at Chaparral High School with a 100% pass rate on the exam. And I wanted to be able to explore these diverse ideas in a safe environment. Seconds. With this new proposal, right, I am unsure that I will be able to receive the best education and be able to pursue the future that I want, right? The course description of the AP Lit course states that issues that from a specific cultural viewpoint may be controversial. Time, thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're done with public comments. We're on the consent calendar. Um, item B, all matters listed on the consent calendar are considered routine and all will be in, enacted with one vote. There is no discussion of the consent calendar items unless members of the governing board or staff request that specific items be removed from the consent calendar for separate action. I'm up, for, I'm up for that, Layla. You want to come up forward? Thank you. Um, just want to say thank you for making. Yes, I did. Thank you for making the exception. Um, okay. Mm -hmm. I am Layla Andrade, an AP literature student at Great Oak High School. I wrote a poem called "Do Not Forget." I just want to say. Even though I wrote the poem, it was on behalf of the students in our district and farther than that. Um, it was on the critical ban, race theory, and walkouts. Definition of history. The study of past events, particularly in human affairs. History gives us the tools to analyze and explain problems in the past. It positions us to see patterns that might otherwise be invisible in the present. History helps us avoid our same faults. History gives us the stories of our ancestors whose voices were unheard during their times. History gives us the love History teaches us to love and respect one another. No matter the color of his skin, her sex, or their identification, history. The importance of history, the importance of education. <laughs> Let's not forget the Trail of Tears, Dr. Martin Luther King, Civil War, Let's not forget what history is for. Tommy Edson is a blind man and he thinks of us as humans. He thinks you're beautiful if you can make him laugh. They say a blind man is no judge of color. So you can judge me by my character and my likes, but you can never judge me on my skin. You can never judge me on my identification or sex. We've been fighting for so long, all those wars, all those protests, all that violence doctor wanted us to avoid, but our ancestors felt hopeless. So listen to us seconds. now. Do not repeat history, that is not what it's for. History is to learn, to feel, to experience. Do not ban our history, do not ban our stories. History, let's not forget who we are and how we got here. Do not force us to forget. Thank you. Thank you. All matters listed on the consent calendar are considered routine and all will be enacted with one vote. There's no discussion of the consent calendar items unless members of the governing board or staff request that specific items be removed from the consent calendar for separate action. I call for a motion and a second to approve by consent items one through 38 that were not pulled for separate action or tabled. Can I ask here to uh, request to move item number 22 for discussion? Okay, item number 22 for discussion. Any other items from any other board members? Okay, so what we'll do is we'll vote on items 1 through 21 and 23 through 38 before we have discussion on item 22.
So we need a motion and a second for items one through 21 and 23 I'll make a through motion. 38. We have a motion for uh, from Mrs. Barclay. Do we have second. a second? We have a second from Mr. Gonzalez. All in favor, say aye. 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 A motion adopted for items 1 through 21 and 23 through 38. 5 to 0. So now we can talk about item 22. This is Wersmith. So this um, came up as a result of talking to some constituents, and from my own knowledge, I would love to know more information here. I'm just going to read an excerpt. Um, it has to do with Tesla, and Tesla installing major-sized backup battery systems in the schools, and I'm just curious, as uh, this constituent has brought up the full understanding of long-term costs and maintenance, um, I'm not an expert in this area, which is why I just wanted to hear from someone tonight who might be able to expound on it. Um, Tesla usually maintains their batteries for, what, 10 years? They're expensive to replace. Um, when you dispose of them, they can cause hazardous waste. Uh, so I don't know how much all of us know. I'm just curious in a more full understanding of the long-term costs of owning and operating the systems. It looks like this is an addendum. So I'm just interested in who can tell me more. So I'm happy to answer um, that, so, uh, Mrs. Wiersma. Alamos Elementary School, Paba Valley Elementary School, Tony Tobin Elementary School, and Great Oak High School were all deemed emergency shelter areas in the county of Riverside. And as such, we are eligible to receive these energy storages to serve as backup power in case of an emergency and we lose power. These batteries have the ability to provide power. In the interim, however, they actually will end up saving us money because um, they cause ener energy resiliency, essentially. And you'll notice in the financial impact, it's an estimated tax credit right off the bat of $472,000. But we've already declared these sites emergency shelters. These are just the backup, backup battery power to provide power in the event of an emergency. Great, thank you. And do you see that expanding to other campuses, or those are those are the ones? Ooh, those are the ones we believe. Okay, yeah. great, thank you. No problem. And so, no cost to the district. Perfect. Thanks so much. Any other discussion on item twenty-two? Uh, do I have a motion and a second on item twenty-two? Moved. Moved by Mr. Schwartz. A second. And I'll second. Seconded by Mrs. Wiersma. All in favor, say aye. 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 Motion passes. Five to zero. And now, item N, uh, information reports, and we will uh, discuss 2002 uh, California dashboard reports. And at this time, I'd like to invite up Ms. Lisa Brown. She is our Director of Assessment and Accountability in the Educational Services Department to lead us through this presentation. Good evening. I'm so glad everybody stuck around for the dashboard. <laughs> so I'm thrilled to present Temecula Valley's um, dashboard for the 2022 school year. Um, so tonight we're gonna take a look at what is the dashboard. So the dashboard is California's accountability system. It reports out student performance on the California Assessment of Student Performance and Progress, we affectionately call CASP. The CASP is taken every spring by students in third through eighth grade, including our juniors. And it measures how districts, schools, and student groups are performing across state and local indicators. It allows parents and educators the opportunity to identify strengths and areas of improvement within those indicators. The dashboard got a makeover this year, so it looks different than it has in years past. In prior years or prior to 2020, you will have seen what kind of looks like a dashboard dial or a gas gauge in one of five colors that corresponded to a performance level. Those performance levels were 
calculated by taking the current year's results and looking at the rate of change from the prior year. This year, because we had a two-year hiatus um, due to COVID, this year is a year of status. So the dashboard looks like a bar graph, ranging from very low to very high, depending on the performance level. And there is no five-color code system. It is strictly purple. So what are the indicators that the state looks at? There are several, they fall into three performance bands. We have academic performance, academic engagement, and conditions and climate. So they take a look at how we performed in language arts, or ELA, mathematics, English learner progress, college and career readiness, which is not on this year's dashboard, chronic absenteeism, graduation rate, suspension rate, as well as local indicators, implementation of the academic standards, access to a broad course of study, the basics, access to teachers, educational materials and high quality facilities, parent and family engagement opportunities, and local climate surveys. It's important to note that the local indicators are indicators where we use local data that is reported through our LCAP, and the LCAP is then reported to the dashboard. So which student groups are included in the dashboard? It's important to note there are 13 student groups that the state mandates that we provide specific in information on in a system of accountability. Those 13 student groups are listed there for you. So what were our student, student demographics? Last year, we served just under 27,000 students in TVUSD. 29% of them were socioeconomically disadvantaged, roughly half of the average of the state. We have 5% English learners in our district and just under 1% foster youth. On the top, you'll see the state's dashboard. And on the bottom, you'll see TVUSD's dashboard. We're gonna go through each one of these indicators, but it's important to note a couple of things. TVUSD outperformed or performed exactly the same in every single indicator as the state did. We were also the highest performing district for language arts and math in the county. It's also important to note that in the blue boxes, you'll see that we met criteria for each of the local indicators, which are reported through our LCAP process. You'll see that chronic absenteeism and um, suspension rate have a reverse uh, criteria than the rest of them, but we're gonna go through that in, later in the presentation. So let's take a look at the first performance indicator. The first performance indicator is how we performed in language arts, and TVUSD outperformed the state at the high level. You'll also see how California performed at the state level and how TVUSD performed at the state level for each of the 13 student groups. If it is a light purple box, it means that we met the, the performance level of the state. If it's a dark purple box, it means we outperformed the state level. If it's a yellow box, it means that we were below the state level, and I'm happy to report there's not a single yellow box in the entire presentation. <laughs> the second academic indicator is mathematics. Again, TVSD outperformed state levels, and again, each of our student groups outperformed or matched the state level. Math has been um, an area of need, both nationally and uh, at the state level, so it was great to see how well our students performed. Academic performance for English learners. Our students, 52% of our students who are classified as English language learners made, pro made progress towards proficiency levels. I'm happy to report that, 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 that this is the exact same level that it was in 2019 pre-pandemic. So these particular students held strong in their course of study and their ability to make progress towards English proficiency. 
you can see that how our current English learners performed in um, relation to classified learners, so students who used to be part of the English learner program, and as well as our English only students. You can see in ELA and math how they're performing in comparison to one another. Again, well above the state uh, performance indicators. The next band is academic engagement. This looks at graduation rate as one of the performance indicators. We are happy to announce that nearly 95% of TVUSD seniors last year graduated. Um, it's important to note that 5% of the seniors who aren't included in this demographic are normally kept um, they do graduate, but oftentimes through summer school matriculation or as fifth year senior, seniors for our EL populations or our uh, special education populations. You can see at the table on the right that there is no performance level, level for foster youth, Native American or Native Alaskan, Native Hawaiian or Pacific Islander, and that is because those student populations are less than 30 students. So when you look at the dashboard, which is public to everyone, you can see that they aren't uh, given a performance level, but you can see the data. So I'm happy to report that each one of those categories um, Native Hawaiian, for example, had 100% graduation participation, um, and each one of them was above 92%. <laughs> the next academic engagement is chronic absenteeism. It's important to note that this is where the bar graph flips. So you want a very low status on this particular indicator. You can see that 26.2% of our kids were chronically absent, which means they missed at least 10% of the school year. So if you are a student who's enrolled for the entire school year and you attend 180 days, you missed 18 or more uh, days last year. You can see that we matched exactly what the state averages were last year. This is in large part due to Omicron, COVID, and mask or in mandates for quarantine. The suspension rate is also the reverse. So you can see that we outperformed the state indicator. 2% um, of our students were suspended last year one day. We um, exceeded the state average, and several of our student populations performed better than those of the state level. So what are the next steps? What do we do with this data? It's important to note that this is a single snapshot of how the district is performing. And we have many other metrics and systems of accountability that we look at to see the district as a whole. But we do use this as part of our local control accountability plan, or what we affectionately call LCAP. It is part of the local control funding model, and we are currently in year two of a three-year plan. The plan is reviewed every single year and submitted for review. The plan must include key goals for students with specific student populations being kept in mind when we're writing those goals. We must develop an action plan with expenditures on how we're going to achieve those goals and which metrics we are going to use at both the state and local level to measure those goals. So each site looks at this data and compiles it with other lo local metrics to make student-centered and data-driven decisions. These decisions are made in a variety um, of ways at a variety of meetings with community partners. Some of those meetings might be the CAP meetings. It might be the school site council meetings, ELAC, DLAC, or our CAC meetings. Our bargaining teams also have meetings where they provide stakeholder input. And all of these recommendations we compile between the months of February and March and we bring to the board for your recommendation. 
So I look forward to coming back to you in future months to kind of present where we are with the LCAP and where we are heading with year three. At that, um, any questions? Um, I just love to make a comment, if I may. Um, thank you so much for your presentation. It was really informative, super helpful. Um, I just want to say that these numbers are amazing. It's wonderful. It's a testament to the leaders we have here, Dr. McClay, all of our teachers. Um, you know, they're making this happen, and, and I think this just really shows that this district is headed in the right direction. Lots of work still to be done, obviously, with the LCAP uh, moving that plan forward, but um, just congratulations to everyone who, who's been working on the ground with the students in order to achieve these results, so thank you. I'd like thank to you, uh, jump in here. Uh, first of all, Lisa, congratulations on your first presentation. <laughs> we, we knew when we put you in this position that you would be great at it, and you proved it tonight. Very proud of you and what you did. And I'm proud of our staff and our students for uh, what they have accomplished. To be number one in uh, language arts and math in the county is a tremendous achievement, tremendous uh, kudos to the parents, the students, and the teachers of our district, our administration, our uh, math TOSAs, our language arts TOSAs, all those people who are involved in making sure that our children are getting a quality education. Very proud of what we just saw tonight. Thank you. I'd like to echo what Mr. Schwartz said and Mrs. Uh, Barclay said as well. And um, any other comments? I'd like to uh, bring up um, Nicole Lash uh, for item two, certification substitute compensation, as she will give her presentation. Actually, I'm going to pass it off to Mr. Arce uh, in re Human Resources for this item, but I got your Thank back, you. Frank, if you need anything. <laughs> All right. Good evening, President Komorowski, members of the board. My goal today is to provide you with some important data and information related to our certificated substitutes. I'd like to start off by saying, first and foremost, we greatly appreciate the work of our guest teachers. I personally have two children, actually, who have ample experience being classroom substitutes. And having been a teacher and a school administrator myself for many years, I know firsthand the powerful impact that our subs have on students and our community. So I just want to say we're very thankful and we value the work of our subs. So let's get right into it. Tonight, I'm gonna give a brief presentation which I'll provide you with some important data related to our substitute workforce, <coughs> some historical context related to our pay rates, some pay comparisons to local districts, and close with some important factors to consider in a potential future decision. Let me start with the sub-related data. I'll start with... <coughs> I'll start with this important data related to last year, 21-22. Please know that this is the year that we transitioned to a full in-person instructional model and we saw some staffing challenges as a result of pandemic-related impacts. As you can see, we had a total pool of 562 subs in our system. Of those, 376 were active subs who accepted at least one assignment. And we had an average of 99 jobs per day with a 54% fill rate, leaving 46% unfilled. And I want you to know the unfilled are normally covered through regional subs, prep period coverage at the secondary level, and other measures. So now let's look at where we're at, 22-23. In comparing the same time frame window, this year we have 853 available subs in our system, with 484 of them being active subs. Our average jobs per day has increased to 127, which actually may be the result of an increase in, in trainings or professional development or other instructionally related absences, which were not as common last year. Yet the fill rate has increased to 74%, with an unfilled rate at 33%. I'd like to now share with you some historical context. In 2018-2019, our daily rates were 110 for short-term 
and 120 for long-term. And long-term is 16 consecutive days or more. That amount was later increased. And prior to the temporary increase approved by the TVUSD governing board, our daily rates were 124 short-term and 141 long-term. Then in September of 2021, the governing board took action to increase those rates to 160 short-term and 170 long-term in an effort to mitigate the effects of the ongoing pandemic recovery and the national labor shortage and to remain competitive with surrounding school districts who quite frankly took their daily rates up to 200, 220. In June 2022, after having seen some relief from pandemic-based substitute shortages, the district brought forward a recommendation to the governing board, which led to the approval of a reduction equivalent to 50% of what had been the temporary increase, resulting in now our current amounts, which are at the far right, the amounts of 142 for short-term and 155 for long-term. On this slide, I've excluded the 1920 and 2021 school years as the data related to those years was specifically impacted by the pandemic, but you can see that our fill rate for 1819 was over 90%, 21-22 was 54%, as I mentioned, and we're currently at 74%, which is quite frankly at par with what we're seeing uh, across the county and across the states with different districts, but, and we're definitely trending upward. Here's some important data regarding uh, uh, surrounding districts and comparisons. We did an inquiry across the county and most districts actually kept the rates that they increased during the peak of the pandemic related staffing shortages. You'll see that TVUSD is the lowest as it relates to short term and long term daily rates as compared to surrounding districts. However, it's also important to note that there are some structural, structural differences to consider when doing side by side comparisons with other districts. Some districts, for example, have an eight hour workday on the certificate side of, th certificated si side of things, and others have something like a seven period schedule at the secondary level. So those are important things to consider. In any case, for comparison purposes, here are the rates that other districts are currently using. Lastly, I wanna share some important factors to consider. First and foremost, there's an increase in cost when making determinations regarding pay rates. With our current data, and based on our substitute workforce averages, for example, a $10 increase in both the short-term and long-term would be roughly equivalent to about $355,000 per year. So matching Marietta's rate, as an example, would be at a cost a little over $700,000. Secondly, I want to mention there's also an important Ed Code provision to keep in mind. Ed Code 44977 states that when a certificated employee exhausts all available sick leave, the amount deducted from the salary for five months after that time period shall not exceed the sum that is paid for a substitute employee. This means that a higher substitute daily rate will likely impact the per diem rate of certificated staff on differential pay, which is what that five month period is referred to. Which at times, uh, when, when employees are uh, going through that differential pay, it's directly related to a leave for medical reasons. The third point I wanna make is on the procurement and recruitment side of things, it's important to know that even with all the increases across the county and state, districts are actually continuing to report substitute shortages Additionally, our data does not indicate that we have less of a substitute pool or less active subs. However, on the salary increases side, uh, side of things, it's also critical to note that salary increases have been done across the board for all of our employee groups at TVUSD, and those do not always reflect the increases made for our substitute staff. So it's imperative that those rates also be periodically updated. And lastly, it's always a priority, of course, for our district to remain competitive and adequately compensate while balancing that with being fiscally responsible. So that's actually all the information I have for you tonight. Please know that the district does not have any specific recommendation regarding potential 
changes in the pay rates. However, it is my goal that this data and this information uh, can inform any decision regarding this topic. If there's any additional information uh, or action item that you would like me to bring to the board, including potential fiscal impacts, I'm happy to bring that topic back. Does the board have any questions for me at this time? Yes, thanks for your presentation, Mr. Ars. Um, so there's a lot of variables. My concern is that our substitute teachers at TVOSD are not being paid a competitive wage in Temecula Valley. How can we get this to happen? And, and can you simplify that language for me? I'm advocating for the subs out there. And so what I heard is that we're paid the lowest in surrounding communities, but there's something called a community standard. We should match that. We should, we should be attracting subs from all over the valley to Temecula instead of our subs leaving right. TVUSD to go to the surrounding communities. So for me, I'm trying to get a very simplified version of how much our subs make versus, let's say, Marietta. Right. So I can wrap my head around this. And, 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 and that was specifically, and first and foremost, I, I want to make sure I share this. I don't disagree with any of that at all. I just want to be clear that any change will obviously have a fiscal impact, um, even a $10 increase for short term and long term, uh, given the amount of substitutes that we have, the workforce use uh, will likely uh, amount to about $350,000, right? So um, as you see those comparisons, we are definitely at a place where we want to make sure we, we compete and we want to make sure that people feel also that we, uh, that we value them. And if this does not appropriately reflect that, um, that if the board has any recommendation that we take action Excuse on that. Excuse me, Mr. Schwartz, you might want to mute yourself. There's some heavy breathing going on. <laughs> uh, I don't know if it's your mic or somebody's mic. It, it might be. I'm sorry, my mic was muted. So it wasn't okay, okay. Then oh, it wasn't you, me. So I'm sorry, maybe I should okay, step back a little. Um, I have an additional but, question. Thank you for sharing. Sure. So one thing that I did a lot of during my campaign as I talked to parents and I talked to teachers. And I have a text here that I'm looking at and um, my heart kind of went out when I, there's heart on the bingo card. <laughs> if you guys are keeping track, there you go. Um, but this is, this is what she reflected. The teachers are losing their prep periods covering for other teachers. And I'll be honest with you, the quality of subs has gone down because we're losing them to Marietta and other districts. Um, our district principals have spoken to the district, but things haven't changed, we're just concerned, we're seeing teachers burn out. And so that's one end of the conversation, but then I think the other is I've done some research and kind of heard that some teachers have maybe six periods, they have a prep period where they can go sub in another right. classroom, and then maybe there's an opportunity where they're earning money for that. So I'm just, I'm trying to simplify it, and as Dr. K said, honor our subs and our teachers because at my son's school, I heard that one fell asleep at the desk, and this came from a teacher, you know, that the sub just wasn't who they right. needed to be. And so that's, I think, our concern is, yeah. what can we do to, to bring that up and then look at the whole spectrum right. of other factors? So let, let me start by saying we have high standards for all of our employees, including substitutes, uh, and it's not okay to uh, go to sleep in the classroom while you're supervising mm -hmm. students. And I'd be happy, and Mr. Joe Mueller would be happy to follow up on any situation related to that. Uh, as it relates to the prep piece, so you're right, uh, teachers at the secondary level, uh, there is a six period master schedule, and they do have a prep period, and at times when there are not sufficient subs uh, to cover the, the, the absences or, or any vacancies, uh, teachers are called upon to work during their prep. And, and so that typically uh, works out. Uh, we also have a regional sub um, pool and, and a process that we started this year that's helped out. So in essence, if you're a sub that reports on a daily basis to a region, you might not work at the elementary school because they may not have a need for you, but you'll report to the middle school or to a, a high school uh, in proximity to, to that region. So uh, it is my assessment that uh, the last time that we were in some severe staffing shortages as it relates to subs, we were actually calling upon district administration, uh, different folks, and kind of sending them out to different, different schools that weren't meeting the, uh, the substitute needs. In this particular case, the data indicates that we are, uh, we are in a better place than we were, say, January 2022. Uh, with that said, other districts, uh, possibly because they're funded differently, a myriad of different reasons, uh, kept those 
increases that were initially made on a temporary ba basis as a, um, as a result of the pandemic shortages, which ended up uh, leaving us at, at this point. So I'd be happy to take any recommendation, but I just wanted to make sure that I fully inform the board of all aspects of this situation. Thank you, and I do have a recommendation. Would it be fair request to, we, we want competitive rate, uh, um, wages uh, for the subs, but we also want to maintain fiscal responsibility, so it would be a fair request to have maybe yourself and, and Mrs. Lash generate numbers on, on, on an increase to, uh, you know, to uh, maintain a community, uh, community standard for a one, two, three year range so that we could see numbers, tangible numbers. Not Mrs. tonight, of course. Mrs. Lash, you're much faster and better at this than I am, but if I've done the math correctly, you're saying for every $10 per day, Mr. Arce, it's about $355,000 per year on average. Obviously, we can never predict the exact number of subs we're gonna use in a year, but if we use past- On an, on an ongoing basis. Past practice. So if we went the 142, which our rate is currently for short term, and we matched Marietta and Lake Elsinore, which is 160, that's 18%. I'm coming up with about $640,000. Um, I think it's really important that our board know too that this is an unrepresented group. All of our other employees are represented at the negotiations table for annual reviews and typically annual increases. Um, I hate to say it's often a forgotten group, but they're not represented. And so I just feel that it's important. I know we've had previous boards that have really felt that every time one of our other associations has an increase, we need to look at this group. And so hence why we're bringing it forward to you and showing you it is low. You could take it up to those two districts and we've given you that approximate cost, but if you'd like more numbers, Mrs. Lash can run them far more I, accurately. I, and I think we could likely provide at least a, a few different scenarios and then uh, send the board uh, that information for your consideration. Thank you, that'd be very helpful. I would love if that. If I could just jump in for a second. Um, this is something we've talked about in the past. We did raise the salaries of the subs during the pandemic. And I think it's something that needs looking at. Uh, I would agree that Frank and uh, Nicole can put together some numbers for us so that we can make it. And it will be our decision, whatever, whatever we decide. So I, I think it would be good for them to put the numbers together and then we can discuss it at length and decide how we want to handle it. Thank you. Sounds good. We we can do that. Yeah, and Thank Mr. Arce, I, I I would also like to see that that brought forward um, potentially at our, our next available opportunity at the next board meeting. Um, this, along with a few other positions, were very important to look at, and I'm I'm glad that you brought it forward. Um, there there's also a concern. Um, I I do want to take that time to get some feedback from from the community, from the teachers, from subs on what that rate should be, and if there are any other uh, impacts that we may not see. So maybe something that we could put out to our, our teachers, our staff, um, to get some public input, um, if there's anything that maybe we're not evaluating based on this. But I'd, I'd like to see the next meeting. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, couldn't I? Yeah, Ms. Barkley. Maybe we can go like down the line for comments or something like that, just so we, we, got, we got a little forgotten down here. Um, Cause there's a big gap. Uh, anyway, um, um, I do agree, and I'm wondering, uh, Mrs. Lash, when we come back, if we're looking at numbers, if you can tell us, like, where would we get that money? Because I know we so wish we had money, too, the majority of our subs don't. are paid for out of the unrestricted general fund. Okay. Um, Dr. McClay said it very well, um, that an, just to match Marietta, it will cost us approximately 650000 maybe $700,000 annually. Mm -hmm. um, and so that comes out of the big pot of money, right? That all comes from the same place. And so we heard that the board was interested in being competitive, but that's not very clear direction on what competitive means. So now I think we have a better understanding is our neighbors, when we look at Marietta and Temecula, you know, quantified. The other thing that we can bring back that I know we've looked at in the past is a tiered approach. So maybe year one, it increases a certain amount and then year two, it's guaranteed and year three, something like that. Um, so we can bring options for the board to consider so it doesn't have to be all at once um, or even plan for potential increases down the line because they, uh, as Dr. McClay mentioned, are an unrepresented group. You could build in um, 
for future raises as well. So, and uh, Mr. Arce said it excellent. Um, so this is in an effort to be competitive. It's not necessarily with the expectation that we're going to get more sub coverage because our rates are right in line with Marietta, Lake Elsinore. They're not having better luck filling their vacancies, but we do feel like it would allow them to, us to have a better, more competitive salary schedule for them. Right, yeah, I, I love that tiered approach, and I know as an employer myself, it's been very difficult to fill positions. It's a really tough labor market, but it's great news that we're, we're getting closer and it's getting better, a little bit better. So hopefully we can do something for the subs to really you know, show them our appreciation and kind of boost that up to get high quality subs in our district. So thank you, thanks you both for the information. Okay, now we're on to action items. Number one, governing board meeting schedule for 2023. I call for a motion as second to select a schedule for regular in-person board meetings for 2023 with closed session of the regular meetings commencing at 4 p.m., open session recognitions commencing at 5.30 p.m., and open session business meeting commencing at 6 p.m., and we have it right in front of us. Do we have discussion? Well, I call for a motion in a second, but I'm assuming we're going to... Oh, do we need to do a motion in a second first before we choose an option, or...? Yeah. We can talk first? Yeah, okay. I, I was assuming, yeah. I think Dan just said two. Option two? No. <laughs> oh, I thought you said... Okay. I, I, I'm sorry, I, I, it just sounded like we skipped over. There was two options, so I was just... Oh, yeah. Trying to... Oh, yeah, no, we're... Uh, I was we're just, just saying, let's talk. discuss both and figure out, yeah. Okay. I mean, my personal vote, it's been really hard not to have this calendared for me, because... You don't want to see my calendar, but um, I personally, option two would work best for me and my schedule. Um, and there, I did have one request um, about the April 18th meeting. I did talk to Dr. McClay if there was an opportunity to move that meeting in April, and I'm not sure if there was an alternative to that. Uh, Allison. Uh, yes, I was going to say the same thing. I'm going to be in Hawaii for my daughter's wedding on April 18th. So uh, since if you can't be there and I can't be there, perhaps we could move that. Uh, well, to I'll be here, but I'd rather not miss something that I would have to miss That's that night, I mean. but I will miss well, it. Maybe we could to. Move, that, move the meeting to another day. April 4th is spring break, but we could very easily move it to April 25th if the board prefers. That would be great for me. One moment. If we go with option two, I'm all right for April 25th, but I'm leaning towards option one, so I'm opening that up. The reason being is because I'm on a subcommittee with the city, and this would allow more city meetings outside of just school board meetings. I talked with city officials. I believe there's six or seven meetings that school board members could attend and also do their school board meetings as well. So I lean towards one. I think, wasn't there a number listed on there of how many school, are you talking about city council meetings? Yeah, that's right. I think so it that just conflicted not an overlap. like two more. One had, uh, do you know where the information was, Dr. McClay? I think one had seven conflicts and one had nine. Mm -hmm. Mr. Hammond's is like gonna pull it up. So I Thank have, you. we'll be able to make seven out of the nine meetings and then still attend school board meetings, but yeah, we can still look that oh, up. Oh, eight and nine. It's just one difference, one meeting different. Option one has eight conflicts and option two has nine. Ah, uh, so you're saying option two still has a good city. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, okay. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's just one different. I'm, I'm open to either option. I'm fine with either. Hmm. Steve, Please. and you, you lean uh, towards two? Well, I, uh, I know I'm, uh, I did talk about on the 18th of April, and I know I am going to be out of the country for a significant amount of time in September, so uh, I don't really have a, uh, I would, I don't really have a preference. Um, uh, wait a second, no, not in September, I'm sorry, in June, I'm going to be out of the country from uh, June 1st till probably sometime in the middle. It's our 70, I'm sorry. It's my wife and I's 75th birthday. We've been planning this 
trip for years and it's finally come to pass. So we'll zoom I don't, in, I, Steve. I, I, I will go along with whatever everyone else zoom you know. in. Yeah. So if there isn't much preference, could I make a motion that we adopt option two with the change of the April 18th meeting to the 25th would be the motion that I would like to make. What is, what is that workshop? Um, I don't know that we've decided the topics yet. Uh, for which, which right? month? We haven't decided April the is typically yet. the LCAP. Oh, so yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, I was option one, but I'm out teamed on option two, so I'm totally willing to vote in option two. That's Thank totally you. fair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, and we're going to move the 18th to the 25th. 25th. Is that correct? Uh huh. Yes. Awesome. Fantastic. Yeah. So, so do we have a motion for option two with an amended uh, amended for uh, what is it? April 18th to the 25th. Um, do we have a motion and a second for that? I'll second. I made the motion. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Ms. Barclay. And then. All in favor, say aye. 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 Look at us working passed. together. Good job, team. To yeah, death. thank you, guys. That's great. That's good. Okay, on to item two, fiscal year 2021-2022 financial audit report. And this is the one, uh, Mrs. Yeah, Lash, this yes, is me. that you were presenting. Yes. And thank again, you. I'm going to pass it off. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Um, so we That's have true. actually our audit manager here with Ide Bailey, our audit firm, who's here to present the audit report um, on behalf of their firm. I don't think your mic's on. You'll see a green. Good? Yep. Got okay. it. Uh, my name is Scott Braddock, and I'm a manager with Ide Bailey LLP, the district's external auditors. And I will be presenting the 21-22 audited financial statements and the 21-22 performance audit report for the district's building fund Measure Y. I'll begin with the district's audited financial statements, um, which is the larger of the two reports provided. Um, there's a lot of information in this report, but to keep this presentation somewhat brief, I'd like to focus primarily on the audit itself and the results of the audit. Uh, so with that said, I'd like to refer you to page 107, which is the summary of auditor's results. that page. Um, and on this page, there are three se sections that we issue audit opinions on. There's the financial statement section, the federal award section, and the state compliance section. And of the different types of opinions we can issue, um, an unmodified opinion is essentially a clean audit opinion. Uh, there is nothing we identified that resulted in a modification or a qualification of the opinion. So when you see the term unmodified, it essentially just means a clean audit opinion. So I'll begin with the financial statements section. We issued an unmodified opinion in relation to the financial statements. We did not identify any material weaknesses or significant deficiencies in internal controls over financial reporting. And those determinations are made based on procedures we perform throughout the year where we review internal control processes over various areas that could have um, financial statement impl implications such as purchasing, payroll, et cetera. So through those procedures we performed, again, no internal control issues noted. We also didn't identify any instances of noncompliance in relation to the financial statements. The next section is the federal award section. The district receives federal funding uh, through various federal programs each year and we're required to audit certain programs every year. The programs we audited this year are shown around the middle of the page under that bold header identification of major programs. So this year we audited the special education cluster and we also audited various COVID programs that are collectively referred to as the Education Stabilization Fund. 
So through our audit of these programs, again, we perform internal control uh, review procedures and back to uh, under that federal awards header. Again, we didn't identify any material weaknesses or significant deficiencies in relation to internal controls over the, the federal programs we audited. And again, we issued an unmodified slash clean opinion in relation to the federal programs, and we did not identify any instances of noncompliance in relation to the programs. The, uh, the last section on this page is the state compliance section. There are various state programs that are specific to the state of California, and they're shown on pages 104 and 105. Um, we audit these programs uh, every year and, again, look at internal control processes and whether or not the district's in compliance with these programs. Um, and similar to our, uh, our results of the financial statement and federal audits, uh, we issued an unmodified opinion, and we did not identify any instances of noncompliance um, or internal control deficiencies related to these state programs. So in summary, uh, no, f no findings to report. It's a clean audit. And I think it's uh, noteworthy, especially this past year, uh, there were a lot of I mean, there were a ton of compliance changes. I, I've, I've never seen the number of new changes in a, in a single year than there were this past year. Independent study changes. There are many new federal programs. A lot of those programs you see there are new this year. And with each of those programs, there's various compliance requirements that districts have to stay updated on and make sure that they're following. Also for state compliance, there were a lot of new state programs added this year. So, I mean, historically, Temecula hasn't had findings. I can't remember last year it, the district has had findings, but I would say for a district this size, to not have findings this year, I, I just think it's commendable and noteworthy because across the board, we've seen a ton of findings this year due to these compliance changes. So again, I just think it's noteworthy that there weren't any findings this year. So with that said, um, are there any questions on the district audit report before I move on to the bond audit report? No? I'd just say fantastic job as usual by cabinet. It's very, very impressive that um, such a clean audit in so many years in a row, and like you said, on a, on a really difficult year with a lot of changes. So congratulations on that. That's great. I, I have to jump in and say, considering the amount of money in our budget, for this to come out the way it did, kudos to uh, everybody involved, uh, especially Nicole, who keeps her eye on the uh, pennies and nickels and obviously knows what she's doing. And also congratulations to the rest of the cabinet administration for doing a great job. Yep. So that was the district audit report. Uh, now begin the, the bond audit report, performance audit. Um, and for performance audit, we sample a selection of expenditures charged to Fund 21 um, under Measure Y, and we review those expenditures for both the existence and operating effectiveness of internal controls as well as compliance under the bond measure. So on page 18 of the Building Fund, fund Report, uh, beginning with item three, it documents a bit about our our sample size, we sampled transactions totaling approximately 7.1 million, which represented 90% of the total expenditures charged of approximately $8 million. Through our review of those sampled expenditures, um, we did not identify any internal control deficiencies or any instances of noncompliance. Uh, so again, similar to the district report, a clean audit, no findings to report. Any questions on the, the bond report? No? Okay, does that conclude the yeah, report? That, oh yeah, thank you, Mr. Um, Braddock, yep. did I pronounce it right? Yep. Okay, do I have a motion and a second for the fiscal year 2021-2022 financial audit report? Moved. To accept. Mr. Schwartz. Moved by Mr. Schwartz, seconded I'll, by. I'll second. Yep, thank you. All in favor say aye. 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 Motion adopted 5-0. And thank you so much for your time, Mr. Brown. All right. Thank you.
Moving on to item three, revisions to the board policy, 511-6.1, uh, intradistrict open enrollment. I call for a motion a second to approve reside, uh, revised BP 511-6.1, intradistrict open enrollment. Move. Do I have a motion to second? All right, moved by Mr. Schwartz. Second. Seconded by Sparkley. All in favor say aye. 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 Motion passes 5-0. Moving on to item four, revised class, classified job description, early childhood specialist. I call for a motion and a second to approve the, the revised classified job description, early childhood specialist. Do I have a motion and a second? I'll call for Move. the motion. I got Ms. Wersma for the motion and Steve, you mind seconding that? Oh, no, absolutely, sir. Okay, okay, thank you. All in favor say aye. 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 Motion adopted, 5-0. Moving on to number five. Let me know if I'm going too fast. Okay. Revised certification job description behavior analyst. I call for a motion a second to approve the, rev the revised certifi certified job description behavior analyst. Do I have a motion a second? I'll make the motion. Ms. Barclay, a motion? Second. Mr. Gonzalez, second. All in favor say aye. 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 Motion adopted 5-0. Item six, revised administrative job description, director, compliance slash human resources development. I call for a motion and a second to approve the revised job description, director, compliance, human resources Move. development. Moved by Mr. Schwartz. Second, second. by Ms. Wersma. All in favor say aye. Can I ask a quick yeah. question oh, yeah. on this one? Oh, Sorry. absolutely. Um, Mr. Arce, this is a current position that we're just revising and adding more hours, is that correct? Well, not, not necessarily more hours. This is currently just an assistant duties. director, mm -hmm. assistant director in compliance, and uh, there's just been an influx in the duties uh, sp uh, sp specifically related to the, um, to the job description that this person will entail. Mm -hmm. And also, in, in order to attract a, a a deeper pool of potential candidates for this position, we think it's more prudent that it become a director of compliance and HRD. Okay, thank you. Any other discussion? Okay, all in favor, say aye. 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 Motion adopted 5-0. We're on to item seven, reclassification of bilingual technician student transfers and enrollment to database staffing and enrollment specialist. I call for a motion a second to approve the new classified job description, database staffing and enrollment specialist. Do I have a motion and a second? Moved. Moved by Mr. Gonzalez, do I have a second? Second. Seconded by Mr. Schwartz. All in favor say aye. 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 Motion adopted 5-0. On to item eight, reclassification of athletic trainer position and revised job description athletic trainer. I call for a motion and a second. Moved. Moved by Mrs. Wersma and seconded by? Second. By one, Mrs. Barclay. Thank you. Um, all in favor say aye. 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 Motion adopted 5-0. Number nine, board assignment for the 2022-2020 Three school year. I call for a motion a second to adopt this board assignment for 2023 or 2022 2023 school year. Do Moved. I have a motion a second? Moved. Okay. Yes, Moved I'm by moving. Mr. Schwartz. And second. Second by Mrs. Barclay. All in favor say aye. 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 Motion adopted 5 0. <clears throat> Item 10, revised classified substitute salary schedule 2022-2023. Call for a motion a second to ratify the revised substitute salary schedule effective January 1st, 2023. Moved. Uh, Moved by Mrs. Wersma. Do I have a second? Seconded by Mr. Gonzalez. Can I just ask a quick question? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Mr. Arce. Francisco? Yes, Mr. Schwartz. Um, you, you're the person who... Um, how should I say? Um, this is my action. This? My, yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. I agree. 
All in favor say aye. 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 Okay. Motion adopted, 5-0. Item 11, California School Employees Association and its Temecula Chapter 538 and Temecula Valley Unified School District Mem Memorandum of Understanding Incentive and Referral Program Hard to Fill Positions. I call for a motion a second to approve the CSEA slash TVUSD Memorandum of Understanding Incentive and Referral Program Hard to Fill Positions. Do I have a motion and a second? Moved. Moved by Mr. Schwartz. Second. Second. Seconded by Ms. Mr. Barclay. <laughs> All in favor say aye. 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 Motion adopted 5-0. On to item 12, Temecula Valley Educators Association and Temecula Valley Unified School District Memorandum of Understanding MOU, retire, retiree medical bridge, January 23rd, 2023. I call for a motion a second to approve the TVA slash TVUSD MOU retiree medical bridge January 25th, 2023 for the 2022-2023 school year. Do I have a motion and a second? Moved. Moved. Moved by Mr. Second. Gonzalez, seconded by Mr. Schwartz. All in favor say aye. 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 Motion adopted 5-0. 13, resolution number 2022-2023 to approve entering into contracts with additional student transportation providers. I call for a motion and a second to approve resolution, uh, resolution number 2022-2023, which finds- Moved. And, let, me, let me finish, Steve. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, no problem. Which finds and determines that based on factors beyond its control, it would work and incongruity or not produce any advantage for the district to competitively bid on the procurement of additional and supplemental transportation services. Uh, do I have a motion to second? Of course I do. Mr. Schwartz moved. Second. Seconded by Ms. Wersma. All in favor say uh, aye. Joe, can we? Yeah, just, absolutely. I, I just have a quick question about yeah. this one, just because this has been a very sensitive topic and it's been brought up quite a bit. Um, this is more of a Band-Aid, I believe. Is there a more permanent solution? that we're already looking into, and is that gonna be something we can discuss soon? So what this does is anytime, so we run our own transportation department and mm -hmm. all work gets offered to them first, only in the event that our employees, because of course we prefer to have our own employees transport our students, in the event that we are not able to transport students, which normally happens in things like um, field trips, and competitions where they are going, they're leaving during the same time where our to and from school transportation happens, we're legally required to go to bid anytime that cost exceeds $10,000. So we went to bid this year and there's a list of vendors that we have to use anytime we want to go outside of the district and we have to use them in the order that they bid. So as soon as we go out, we start at the top and we call and we say, can you take this? No, you can't. Okay, we have to go to the next one, the next one, the next one. Well, the, uh, often we get all the way through the list, no one can take the work. So we start again at the top and we work our way through. What this resolution allows us to do is, yes, th these folks are not on our list of bidders, but it allows us to utilize their services anyway due to the demand and the need, even though they're not on the approved bid vendor list. So it says we went through the list, we did our due diligence according to the law, and now we can ask someone else if they're able to cover this work. But we always try to do it in-house first. So they basically get added to the bottom of the current list of- Exactly, okay. exactly. Thanks. Thank you for that, appreciate it. Okay. Uh, oh, yes, did I have a motion and a second? Yeah, I did. Um, all in favor say aye. <laughs> aye. 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 Motion adopted, 5-0. Item 14, resolution 2022-2023 slash 24, the Board of Education of the Temecula Valley Unified School District approving facility proposal for Temecula International Academy for the 2023, set a typo, 2023 school year? 2023-2024 school year facilities use proposal for Temecula International Academy for the 2023-2024 school year. I call for a motion and a second to approve the facilities use proposal for Temecula International Academy for 2023-2024. Do I have a motion and a second? Moved. 
Moved by Mr. Gonzalez. Second. Seconded by Ms. Wiersma. All in favor say aye. 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 Motion adopted 5-0. Okay, number 15, please bear with me. Certification of signatures. I call for a motion and a second to approve the certification of signatures by the new board members and designee, Dr. Jody McClay, Superintendent, Nicole Lash, Assistant Superintendent, Business Support Services, Courtney Fingerlin, Director, Fiscal Services, Sheila Brown, Assistant Director, Fiscal Services, Allison Bruce, Payroll Supervisor, as authorized agents to sign all A and B warrant orders and general contracts. Jo Dr. Jody McClay, Superintendent. Nicole Lash, Assistant Superintendent, Business Support Services, Kimberly Valles, Assistant Superintendent, Educational Support Services, Francisco Arce. Assistant Superintendent, Human Resources Development, Nicole Deus. Yeah. Assist, uh, Assistant Superintendent, Student Support Services, E. Joe Mueller. Executive Director, Human Resources Development, and Tiffany Martinez, Director, Human Resources Development, to sign notices of employment. Do I have a motion and a second? Move. Moved by Mr. Gonzalez. Do second. I have a second. Seconded by Mrs. Barclay. All in favor say aye. 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 Motion adopted. Five zero. We are on to item 16, retention of temporary and or specialized legal counsel to advise the board. I call for a motion a second to discuss temporary specialized legal services for unique issues or emergency situations. We can, we can bring up uh, Mr. Brenner from EBG to give a five, 10 minute presentation. Move. Move second. By Is it, is it possible to take just a real, two minute break before we start this? We'll do better five minute recess. Oh, five, thank you. We have 12 speakers, so we'll go a little over 30 minutes. We'll recognize everyone and I Please ask to keep it down whether you disagree or agree so that we can get through these and get through to business. And we'll start with the first speaker, three minutes each. All right, our first speaker is Debbie Abrams. On January 18th, you gave three reasons why you decided to hire outside counsel. Number one, you said you felt stonewalled by the superintendent because you asked her to gather all stakeholders, which is a lot of people, for the walkouts for the students with just one week left before Christmas break. This is an absolutely unreasonable expectation. You don't control all the stakeholders' time. There's so much going on. Number two, you said it was because of the protests at the high schools, because we need to keep the children safe. I observed the last two protests at Great Oak. They were safe, well-organized, and peaceful. No classes were missed because it was during intervention and break. The school worked with the sheriff's office. But you asked for a more appropriate time and place. I can't imagine a better time than during the one time of day they won't miss class. But I suspect your plan is never and nowhere. Finally, number three, you said you want counsel who is responsible to you, the board but the district lawyers are already directly responsible to you. The only thing you don't like is that they also look out for the best interests of the district and will tell you if your actions could harm anyone within it. Regardless of what you say this special counsel provides to the district, their actual client will be the new members of the board who are pl making plans which place TVUSD in legal jeopardy. So those were your three stated reasons, but they're all lies. At your very first board meeting, before you say you were stonewalled, before any students protested, you didn't like that the district's lawyers had concerns about your resolutions. You asked, and I quote, would there be an opportunity for a special counsel to advise the board that is not the district's counsel when we're going through and looking at those items? It was clear to everyone who heard that question, you were already planning to hire outside lawyers. After reading your lawyer's letter, some things stood out. 
As soon as you sign that agreement, it becomes retroactive to the date they first did any work for you. The district is responsible for the paying for the time that they've already spent. This is at a rate of $620 an hour, which is more than double the average hourly rate of lawyers in the United States. So I'm standing before you demanding the transparency you have so far utterly lacked. Exactly how much have you already obligated the school district to pay before you've even officially hired them? This is money you're taking away from the general fund. This would pay for substitutes. This would pay for CTE. Stop pretending child safety is why you reached out to these extra lawyers, because you've already shown that to be a lie. I'm sorry, I missed that 30 second warning there. All right, our next speaker is Andrea Hedis. Did I get that right? Good evening, President Gomorowski and school board trustees. A couple of school board meetings ago, we heard the same thing over and over again over the course of six hours. And the sentiment went something like this. If you don't do what I say, then the district will be sued. Why wouldn't we believe it? Those same people are here telling you now that supplemental legal counsel is a waste of money and irresponsible. Make it make sense. It doesn't. We have students that are protesting something that doesn't exist because teachers are afraid that if they talk about something that doesn't exist, they will be in hot water. Yet we should all know by now that by California law, ethnic studies courses must be offered in all high schools starting in 2025. Students will have to take ethnic studies to get a diploma starting with the class of 2030. Ethnic studies is described online and quote, the model curriculum will provide students the opportunity to learn about the histories, cultural struggles and contributions to American society of historically marginalized peoples. The unfounded idea that history is somehow being erased is unequivocally false. Make it make sense, it doesn't. And if you do not continue with the pursuit of diverse legal representation, the threat of, well, if you don't do what I say, or the district will get sued, will become the status quo. We lost a generation of young men and women fighting this type of forced compliance, and this is how we honor them? Diversity is woven into the fabric of the American flag and the American people, which includes diversity, diversity of thought equal to the diversity of representation. This is not complicated. Thousands of TVUSD residents voted for you, Dr. K, Jen, and Danny. You won by hundreds of votes against your opponents, not 25. The parents of Temecula have spoken. We want you. We need you to give those, elected, those that elected you our voices back and keep your campaign promises. It's been made apparent for that to happen. You need additional legal support. Por favor, school board Danny, ayúdanos, and members of the board, help us protect our kids with additional legal counsel. Thank you for your time. Our next speaker is Lynn Pennock. Our next speaker is Stephanie Dawson. Good evening. I'm here to point out a few reasons why the board is in desperate need of supplemental legal counsel. What has gone on in the last few weeks, including the white supremacy in action flyer posted at TVHS, and the two walkouts facilitated by our high schools has violated the rights of the rest of the student population and that of their parents. Not only was it completely unsafe for our schools to facilitate these walkouts, especially without parents aware beforehand, which that in itself presents a liability to our district and our city, but the racism that went on during these rallies was just plain disgusting and creates a hostile environment in our schools and in our community. I listened to many of the speeches, speeches these kids made and saw the poster boards these children held. These walkouts might as well have been labeled anti-white rallies. What was incredibly shocking was to hear some of the child speakers describe themselves as white passing as if they were apologizing for their color of their skin. 
These children are being groomed to be uninformed activists who want to kick and scream about an issue without having a full understanding of it. Close to 20,000 Temecula voters voted for the new board members who ran on an anti-CRT platform. And now, as they try to navigate through the unstable situation being fed by extreme groups in our community, Temecula Unity, I'm looking at you, they need all the legal support they can get. And so far, that doesn't seem to be coming from our current council. Ed Code Title I, Article I, Section 201A states, all pupils have the right to participate fully in the educational process, free from discrimination and harassment. Section 201B states, California public schools have an affirmative obligation to combat racism. Ed Code Title I, Article 9, Section 260 states, the governing board of a school district shall have the primary responsibility for ensuring that school district programs and activities are free from discrimination based on age and characteristics listed in Section 220, which includes race. The Safe Place to Learn Act states, it is the policy of the state of California to ensure that all local educational agencies continue to work to reduce discrimination, harassment, violence, intimidation, and bullying. It is one thing to voice an opinion and want it to be taken into consideration. I can appreciate that of the students, but it's another for them to think that they have the right to force their opinion onto others. To do so using discriminatory talking points is just racist and divisive. Racism is racism no matter who the target is. And just to add, because I have a few seconds off script, a friend of mine whose son attends CHAP, 30 she seconds. had no idea that her that there was going to be walkouts. She's not involved to the level that some of us here are. So she had no idea. And uh, her child ended up walking out, not even aware of what was happening. And she didn't find out until he was marked truant. She goes back to CHAP, and they gave her the runaround or some lame answer. She literally withdrew her child on the spot. So you lost a student, at least one student based on these walkouts. Um, besides that, I just want to say thank you to the board members. We really Time. Our next speaker is Ben Richards. All right. Hello again. It's my second time speaking. And I support this resolution of outside legal counsel, and here's why. Not one minute after I did my last spiel about leadership and coming together, I go to the bathroom and I have a gal, as I'm walking out there, all smiles and nice, excuse me, thank you, and this gal says, you bigot. Now, how does this relate to the outside legal counsel? Because this attitude where does this start from? The leadership. It starts from Mr. Schwartz and Ms. Barclay. And I absolutely believe that the leadership and possibly the superintendent are stonewalling the will of the people because, like I said, no matter how nice we are, no matter how reasonable we are and what we try to do right, you're still going to have people like that who's going to be so mean and disrespectful, and they're going to run a campaign underhandedly to try to sabotage our progress to come together as a unified area and to teach our kids what they need to be taught. Here's another reason why we need this. I work in many districts. I work in all the districts down in San Diego fighting this stuff. This same stuff is in all the districts, the same construct of activist parents, activist teachers, ran by all that stuff. It's in different districts. It's in Poway. It's in Encinitas. And we need outside legal counsel because a parent like me, who's just a dad, I'm trying to raise my seven-year-old son and daughter in this crazy world we live in. But parents like me need protection of this outside legal counsel. I've been criticized. I've been jeered at. I have people from Antifa following me. <laughs> they laugh at me. They follow me. They take pictures of my license plates. And these people laugh. And that's why if you say, I'm going to say my favorite line, if you think we're getting tired, you're wrong. Because we're not going to tolerate being treated with such disrespect. So. Like I said, I wish you all well, and I seconds. hope we all get, a, get along. Like I said in my last speech, we don't need to be calling each other names. We need to move forward 
as a unified society here, but I agree with this outside legal counsel because no matter what you do, the leadership is going to try to sabotage your movements. Our next speaker is Jill Chaprinsky. Gonna make it short. So, we've all been here a while. Um, it's no secret that I fully support this board and believe in the work that they are doing and intend to do. I'm here to support the call for special counsel. I can't imagine a better use of money considering uh, it has been blatantly obvious the current council has zero intention of helping create a less hostile and more conducive space for this board, the district or its students. Ta uh, talking about wasted money is laughable and completely tone deaf coming off all the frivolous waste the, of the last three plus years. I could spend a long time listing all of the wasted spending I have witnessed in my 12 years here involved with this district, but that's a conversation for another day. I applaud this board for recognizing a problem, especially when it comes to safety and accountability and taking swift action and finding a resolution. To the argument that vetted counsel doesn't work in ed law, I say, so what? This system is corrupt, broken, and the roots of that brokenness probably starts with the legal team to begin with. You get what you pay for. And it's high time we work to get to the bottom of that breakdown. Outside legal counsel will offer that opportunity, and therefore, I wholeheartedly support it. A, uh, a person who has nothing to hide, hides nothing. Our next speaker is Shannon Palmer. I know, it's funny. Hi everyone, I'm Shannon Palmer. I'm a parent here in Temecula. Uh, I have a student at Day Middle School and a student at Vail Elementary. I have been on PTA board. I am currently on our school's school site council um, for Vail, not at uh, Day Middle. And I just want to say I support our uh, three new board members and everything that you guys are doing. I second that we need to uh, excuse me, I have a whole, I had something prepared, but I'm not going to go into that because it definitely just mimics what everyone else has been saying, but we need it. We've seen frivolous spending. I mean, I have been at countless school board meetings in the past two and a half years, and uh, Allison benefits from this and Stephen benefits from this, but you got, the previous board approved their raise before they t approved the teacher's raise last year, and I was at that meeting. So let's not forget that. So secondary legal counsel is definitely necessary for this school district. The next speaker is Jean Bimia. Good evening. It's, it's nice to be in a smaller room where we can see each other. I kind of like that. Um, I'd like some background on this item on the agenda. Uh, it's not at all clear to me why we need to have another firm of attorneys uh, right now, nor why this particular firm is a good one to hire. Uh, they're significantly more expensive than the, current, than the current attorneys that the district has, and they don't appear to have any special experience with education or school districts or students or safety. So. So why do you want to consult them? Um, is it because of the recent student walkouts, as, as you mentioned, Ms. Wier Ms. Wiersma? I'm not clear why uh, legal representation or advice is needed for that, but if it is, have you actually consulted the current attorneys that the school district has? And I'd be interested to know, you know what they might have to say. It seems to me that would be the first step. Or do you want these new attorneys um, because you're concerned about the school district or board members being sued over the CRT resolution passed in December? Uh, if so, I'd suggest it might cost a lot less if, if you rescinded that resolution temporarily and called together several people as a committee, teachers, students, 
um, people in the community, such as myself, who would be interested in coming to a resolution that would be more acceptable to everyone. Or perhaps there's something else that you expect to happen or want to happen. I don't know, but if there is, I'd sure like to know what it is. Um, because the bottom line is that every hour that we spend talking to these new attorneys is $620 that won't be spent on student education. Dr. Kamrowski, you promised transparency, but it doesn't seem like we're getting a lot of that. What, um, what's your rush? You're new to this job. Why not spend a little time to look around and talk to a varied bunch of people um, before making decisions that involve a great deal of expense? Thank you for listening. The next speaker is Christine Massa. Thank you. As a TDUSD parent and taxpayer, I oppose using district funds to pay for additional legal counsel. The district already has superb and knowledgeable legal representation. Please remember that the role of legal counsel is not to be yes men. They're there pr to protect you from risk. This also isn't how an entity goes about selecting a vendor. For some of you who ran on transparency, this isn't how you do transparency. Now, Mr. Gonzalez owns a business and Mrs. Barkley runs a nonprofit. I'm sure they can tell you how a procurement process is normally run. And it's not shoehorning in a vendor. First, you agree on a business case. Then if you have a business case, you all agree on the criteria you need for a provider who can give you those services. Then multiple providers state their qualifications to the board and you all agree on which, process, which provider is best. Why would you negate this process? What are you hiding? So let's go back to the business case. The agenda implies this is a precautionary move for emergency situations or unique issues. Well, since you don't know what those issues are until they happen, then you have no criteria for selecting any vendors, which makes your business case null and void. And why you would go back and select Epstein, Becker, and Green, who orchestrated the debacle two weeks ago, is beyond me. They made fools out of you. So I guess we're back to the yes men argument. Selecting lawyers who will tell you that you can do things the district lawyers may have advised you against is high-risk situation and a breach of your fiduciary duties. But here's something we know. We know that Jonathan Brenner is an employment lawyer. Why specifically do you need an employment lawyer? Are you planning to ban books and then go after the librarians and language arts teachers who might not agree? Are you planning to ban LGBTQ plus groups or diversity clubs like the Black Student Unions and then go after the faculty advisors? Are you planning to fire our outstanding superintendent, Jody McClay, or any of her superior executive staff? Are you planning unjust disciplinary actions against staff or students, or is it something else? For instance, I've heard that one of the board members might be being sued for a violation committed under the guise of, of uh, being a school board member and overstepped his or her bounds. Does this person want these lawyers to represent them on the district's dime? Well, no matter what it is, I don't approve of the district using my taxpayer funds to support any of those things above. I want to know what this is for. And if you don't know what specifically it's for and you can't tell us, then use it for substitutes. Thank you. Our next speaker is Edgar Diaz. How are you doing? I was actually going to cede my time until I heard some comments that I just a little uh, not quite sure of. But just one thing on the on the uh, letter that's being provided by the attorney to be mentioned is just a question as far as like being able to be paid for time. I know usually we have a procurement process. I've worked with um, Nicole Lash's department before Nicole Lash, before Nicole Lash was there like three, four times before. And there's always a process of how you go out and, and get services. Uh, and normally it doesn't happen through a board president going out and procuring that. Uh, from the letter, it is addressed to you, and it talks about how fees can be claimed even if for services rendered, even if they don't go, you don't go with them. So that's kind of like the main 
problem I have with that issue is coming back is putting together some kind of contract, even though it's not with the full TVSD process. The other part is the comments that were mentioned is that we hate you or people hate you. I don't think that's true. I've tried to work with all of you. I've tried to make meetings with all of you. And I think you've seen me with you trying to make communications with you guys. Uh, being able to say that people are always going to hate you and do something, I don't think that's right either. So when we look at when individuals come up here and say and try to villainize, uh, villainize people and then be able to say, I'm trying to be nice, but then making faces and jeering at people on the side, I don't think is a very authentic thing to do. Thank you. Our next speaker is Alex Duvas. Good evening, my name is uh, Alex Duvas. I'm a parent of uh, two children who attend schools in this uh, district. My family and I uh, recently moved to Temecula a little less than two years ago, and we came here for one reason specifically above all others, and that was this district's reputation for excellent schools. And in the two years that our students have been students here, we have been nothing short of blown away by the professionalism and by the commitment of all of their teachers and all of the district employees that we've encountered. So I just want to start by saying thank you uh, to everybody for that. I'm also a lawyer. Um, I'm deeply confused about the proposal to hire outside counsel um, to pay for their services in addition to the service of, services of existing counsel to offer a quote niche of needed perspective to the board members, which is what Dr. K uh, explained in a response to a constituent. And again, this is in addition to legal counsel that have already been retained and paid for by the school district. And I believe that before proceeding, the board owes clear and transparent answers to the following questions. What exactly is the anticipated cost of the special counsel for the services that you would like them to perform at a rate of $620 an hour, paid for out of the school district's operating budget. The same firm built another school district $1.3 million. As a parent and as a fiscal conservative myself, I've got serious concerns about the expenditure of any amount of money on additional counsel, and I can imagine many better uses for it. What specifically are the niche legal items that the special counsel would accomplish? What is it about this firm whose practice area appears to center on employment law and litigation and not education issues, makes them more qualified than the district's current counsel to provide whatever niche perspective you're seeking. This same agenda item was previously advertised as relating to personnel matters. Coupled with the board's efforts to hire an outside employment law firm, this raises natural questions about whether this is a precursor to take action against the superintendent or other district personnel. And I want to know, is that your intention? 30 seconds. Will we be privy to the special counsel's advice if it is against a proposed course of action that this board intends to take? And lastly, the same agenda item was previously offered under the guise of an emergency, requiring an emergency meeting with 24 hours notice. What is the emergency? Thank you for listening. And our last speaker is Kelly Maxey. Good evening. I didn't plan to speak tonight, and I don't have a prepared speech. I'm going to just speak from my heart. Jen, I think that you could probably appreciate that. Um, I am a teacher and a parent. I've been a teacher for over 30 years. I currently teach at Vail Ranch Middle School. I teach robotics and the STEM electives. And if anybody knows me, I am always fighting for funds and for materials all the time. And it was recently explained to me the process, so I thought I would share with you the analogy. 
it was explained that the general funds is like a pie. If they give me a bigger slice of the pie, then somebody else is gonna get less of the pie. So when I'm hearing you talk about all these things that you wanna do with the sub increase and you wanna hire this legal counsel, that is a pretty big piece of the pie. So what's not gonna be funded? Is my program not gonna be funded? Is somebody else's program not gonna be funded? What is the result? This is our second board meeting with you guys. All I'm asking tonight is that you pause, that you stop, and you reflect. We don't know what this is about. You haven't been transparent enough. I want to give you the benefit of the doubt, but I want you to come to the table with us and discuss these things and not do it you know, sneakily or shove it in at the bottom of a lengthy agenda. Come and talk to us, okay? But just know that when you make decisions like this, you are affecting the students in our district. You're affecting me as a teacher. That means I'm paying more money out of my pocket to pay for your legal counsel. Thank you. Thank you. So on retention and temporary specialized legal counsel to advise the board, I call for a motion and a second to discuss temporary legalized, specialized legal services for unique issues or emergency situations. Do I have a motion and a second? Moved. Moved by Mrs. Wiersma. Do I have a second? Second by Mr. Gonzalez. All in favor say aye. 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 Isn't this where we discuss? We're not. I we're was not, waiting we're not for making a motion yet. We need, I, I mean, we're need, we need to discuss after the motion is made. I didn't hear anybody have a discussion. Oh. So we can we can certainly okay. We we just went we sorry, went this midway was a motion through the vote to receive information, right? Okay. This was a motion to discuss. To discuss. And to receive information, I would presume from the yes. attorney. Mm -hmm. Correct. Do you want to have discussion? Mishap on Brenner's my part. Please forgive me, Mr. Brenner. We we're now having your approach to give a five, 10 minute presentation, then we can do board discussion. I, I don't think, yeah, I don't, I'm sorry, I don't think we have two days. We don't need a motion for that. Yeah. Right. Right. I don't, we don't need a motion for Mr. Brenner to approach. Right. So, but That's mishap on me for a call. Mr. Brenner, you have the floor. President Komorowski. Madam Clerk Wiersma, fellow trustees of the board, also present, and Superintendent Dr. McClay and the staff as well. It's a pleasure to be here this evening with all of you. It's much warmer in here than out there, as I found out before a seat opened up. Um, but thank you very much for having me here to talk to you for a few minutes about item 016 on the board's agenda. The president asked me to be here to speak briefly to that item. And the genesis of that, as I understand it, is a simple fact of a change in the board composition. There are three newly elected members of the board. And changes in governing bodies, chief executives, senior leadership, often comes part and parcel with on occasion changes in that leadership's closest advisors. Leadership needs to make very important decisions. Those decisions are not always black and white. A, a governing board like this board operates in a legal environment. Very frequently those decisions that the board makes are murky, they're not clear. Legal advice and guidance is not only appropriate, it's absolutely critical. And when there's a change in leadership, it's not unusual for that new leadership to want advisors, especially legal counsel, that it has complete and total trust and confidence in. Now, in this instance, as I understand it, the need for that is particularly acute. The board was elected with expectations in mind. We've already heard references to campaign promises and the expectation that your constituents, the members in, of the community in the district expect. It's the reason why you were elected. It's the reason why all of you were elected. 
you are the democratic representatives of that process. Here it's particularly acute because the board has already instituted some changes, as we know, to the satisfaction of many, to the dissatisfaction of others. That's the nature of the process. And you've already heard comments even here tonight. Pause. Stop. The district will be sued. In an environment like that, where change is coming and change has happened, and maybe further changes will occur or not, very, very good legal advice from, in particular, advisors that the board trusts implicitly, fully and completely, is critical. Now, this is not a criticism of the board's current counsel. I don't know Mr. Robbins. I'm sure he's a very fine lawyer and a very, very good guy. His bio, if you go to his website, under practice areas, it lists one. I just checked it a minute ago. It says employment law, just like mine. The, um, my understanding of why I'm here is that presently, some members of the board do not have full trust and confidence in the board's current legal counsel. That is a situation that is unique, it's urgent, and it needs immediate action. Ask yourselves, if you didn't have complete trust and confidence in your surgeon or your doctor, other doctor, and you were about to have a procedure, would you want to have an RFP? Would you want to wait a month or two or three? Would you want to even wait to the next appointment before you got a doctor, physician, surgeon, for that matter, an accountant or a lawyer that you were not completely confident in? Would you want that? You'd want to do it right away. You'd want to get that lawyer, doctor, surgeon that you were completely confident in. That's why I understand that I'm here. And I also understand that there have been recent issues uh, relating to student walkouts in reaction to board resolutions recently passed that have raised concerns for at least some board members over compliance, liability, and potential litigation. In response to these concerns, the president of this board obtained references, did some research, did some homework, and spoke with me at length multiple times and decided that getting a perspective and having that resource available, I'm honored to say from me and my firm, would be beneficial to the board, which by derivation is beneficial to the district and those that the board represents. That's why I'm here, and that's why we're having this discussion, and why the board tonight has an action item for a motion and a, and a decision whether or not to engage us as counsel. Can the board do that? You've heard about RFP processes. That no, is the normal process for retention of a service provider on a permanent or non-urgent, unique emergency basis. But board bylaw 9124, allows the board in its discretion in situations which it decides. Nobody else, no one in this room, not me, not the staff, not the superintendent. The board majority decides if a situation is unique, with unique demands, or an emergency that requires the retention or justifies the retention of specialized or temporary counsel. And under those circumstances, if the board determines it, an RFP process isn't required. If the board wishes to retain permanent counsel, other permanent counsel, us on a permanent basis, that would, under the board's bylaws, likely require an RFP process. That's not what this process is right now. The urgency and the uniqueness, as I said, is, to my understanding, the present issues involving serious compliance, liability, and litigation concerns, and first and foremost, not having full trust and confidence in the current council. And I think those easily justify, in my view, a determination under 9124 of your bylaws to retain temporary and specialized counsel, which is what the agenda item 
involved and that's something that the board majority determines as i said now let me tell you a little bit about me i've been in practice for thirty years i'm a litigator yes i'm a trial lawyer and i'm an advisor i've spent many many thousands of hours advising boards governing bodies high-level executives and other high-level decision makers on crises, significant issues, significant change issues, significant threat issues in a legal context. Not all of that has been in the education context, but a good deal of it has been. And I do practice in the employment area, like Mr. Robbins, who I'm sure is a, an excellent employment lawyer, advising a district really you can't I mean you need to have employment law knowledge and skills as I'm sure he does um, I also as I mentioned uh, uh, advise or as as others have mentioned I do advise academic institutions for me over m the course of my career that has been predominantly higher ed institutions I served for about a year and a half as outside general counsel for a well-known Los Angeles liberal arts college and uh, I have uh, advised lower level um, schools as well uh, in the secondary and primary space. What I am not is a school district lawyer. And my firm is not, as has been accurately noted by some of the speakers here today. That's very important. As I understand it, I'm here to be of service to the board precisely because I and my firm are not beholden to the next project or piece of work that's going to come from a superintendent somewhere or another staffer or other districts or I'm not and I'm not reliant on case and deal and project flow from the educational community I am truly independent from all of that and I am I would be completely dedicated to advising the board without any of that what I'll call baggage. It shouldn't intrude on, an, on a lawyer's advice, of course, and the ethical rules prohibit it. But human beings are human beings, and law businesses are law businesses. We don't have any of that baggage. For the last five years, I have been counsel to the Orange County Board of Education. I have represented the board in multiple different litigation matters when disputes arose that were very serious. And I've advised the board on many matters pertaining to the board's rights, liability, compliance, governance, and potential litigation. One of the most significant litigation matters that I was counsel of the board in involved a dispute between that board and its superintendent who was elected, constitutional officer like the board, so it's a different situation than here, obviously, um, over the appointment of general counsel. For those of you who are really into the arcana, uh, Ed Code 35041.5 does state that county boards and superintendents shall appoint the same counsel. Well, the superintendent in that instance went ahead and just appointed counsel himself without getting the board's approval. That led to a dispute, which the board tried mightily to resolve. It couldn't be resolved, and it ultimately ended up in very lengthy litigation in the Orange County Superior Court and a, and a trial during the height of COVID over four months, which I tried to the bench. Uh, and we obtained at the end of that trial a, a, a tentative verdict from the court in the board's favor, which then led to a settlement, which then led to the county board of, of Orange County being the only board in the state, and I believe in its history, to have its own general counsel separate from the superintendent. When I come to the table and I'm engaged by a client, I'm there for that client. And that is what I understand the board is looking for, to be an advisor to the board. What's my role going to be beyond that? It'll be focused on, on what I do focus on and have focused on for the last five years with the Orange County Board. Focusing on board rights, the board's authority, 
and also the limits on that authority and the legal compliance considerations that come with that. As I said, we'll be completely independent and uh, there's no history that we have performing any work with Temecula Valley Unified School District. We've never done any, we don't do any now. We're not looking for more work from the district or superintendents or other districts anywhere. That's not what we do. We'll be 100% focused on, in our advice and services under this engagement, to the board and only the board. Not to any individual trustee. We're not here to protect trustees or give personal advice or represent any individual trustee at all. The engagement has to be in strict compliance with the board's bylaws. The board's bylaws currently discuss how council is consulted and engaged. But we will be the board's council and we will advise the board from the perspective of only the board's interest and no other. And of course the board's interest is, is within the context of an important and complex legal landscape where decisions and issues are not always black and white. In fact, they rarely are. Now, let me tell you what I'm not gonna be if the board decides to engage us. I'm not gonna be the general counsel. We're not here to replace Mr. Robbins, and at least my understanding is that the, that's not the board's intentions, certainly not with this action item, nor could it with, some, with a process like this. That would and should require an RFP process. So that's not what we're here to do. We're not here to be a general advisor on all issues, to you know, ring up lots of time on things that you would otherwise generally consult the general counsel for. And we're not permanent, we're temporary. If the board decides after receiving advice from me that it's not worth it, that it isn't a value add, that it doesn't address acutely that problem of not having full confidence in your counsel, or should it change the situation? And you, you, you develop full confidence in your counsel. Board can fire or terminate or disengage us, as I'd like to call it, immediately. That's not a problem. There are no retroactive fees. We, we don't do any legal work until we're actually engaged. We cannot be engaged until a majority of the board at a duly noticed meeting votes after a proper motion to engage us. So uh, while we do occasionally have situations where we're engaged and we do work and then we never get a signature on an engagement letter, which is the reason for language like that, no legal work has been done and the legal fees to date are zero and they will be zero until and unless we're engaged. And then the board will decide how much to use us. And as the stewards of the public trust and funds, you will decide how best to utilize us in the most efficient and cost-effective way to best serve your ends and the districts. The bottom line is this, um, that our understanding is that we're here to help the board get things done. And that is crucially important. You've heard comments here tonight that really touch on this from a few speakers who really have their finger on the pulse of the problem. Being told to pause, especially on just getting some additional legal perspective, a second opinion, why would anyone be against that? I understand the resource issue, um, but, but I'll tell you this, a wrong decision on the legal front can cost you a lot more than a little legal investment up front. But why pause? Why stop? Why? Because change is hard. And if you don't have advisors that you trust, affecting change, even if it's change that is desired by a large number of individuals, a large number of an electorate, a majority of an electorate, change can be hard to affect. Being told that the district's gonna be sued, that I'm not sure if this is legal, I don't know about this. Not being presented with all your legal options, that's another way to gum up the works. I've seen it happen in Orange County. Part of my job is to make sure that you are getting all the options, that you're getting legal advice you can fully and completely trust. Again, that doesn't mean you wouldn't also seek advice from Mr. Robbins and others. You can and you should. 
but I'm here as an additional resource, as I, I, at least I would be, should you engage me. Now, let me, and let me just say this uh, in close before I just quickly address some of the comments uh, that were made um, that I think need a response. The not having confidence in your current legal counsel, again, without any criticism against that legal counsel, that's a critical issue. A client has to have confidence in his or her or its legal counsel. That needs to be addressed immediately, right now. And if it's not us that's hired, then it needs to be someone. There has to be that perspective. It's critical for any client operating in a legal environment to be able to proceed with full confidence that they're getting the advice. That doesn't mean that advice from a legal advisor who you don't have confidence in is giving you the wrong advice necessarily, but it can be paralyzing, paralyzing not to have someone at your side legally that you fully and completely trust. Well, let me just address a few quick comments briefly before I sit down. I already addressed retroactivity. That, that was a legitimate point that someone made, absolutely. And that's not a concern here, it's a non-issue. There are no retroactive fees or legal work that's been done. What's the rush? We've addressed that, I think at least I have. Um, it's, not, it's not acceptable to be trying to make these important decisions and deal with crises that are coming up in real time when you don't have uh, legal advisors that you completely trust. Um, you've heard a lot about expenditures and this $1.3 million number uh, bandied about, which comes from OC Register reports, among other sources, which is not accurate, but fees that we have charged to clients, obviously we don't discuss, uh, but we've handled five lawsuits for the Orange County Board of Education. Um, I'm anticipating that would not be the case here. Um, that, would not, that is not the case for this action item. We're not being retained on litigation. How much would it cost? What is the anticipated cost? Um, another esteemed lawyer asked here tonight. Well, that depends on how much you utilize our services, and the rate is arithmetic from that point. But you're the stewards of the efficient use of resources. I'm assuming you would be good stewards in that regard and not consult us unnecessarily. And we operate and, and work very efficiently. I wouldn't expect, frankly, that there'd be more than a few hours a month in the initial going with you know spikes and ebbs and flows here and there, tapering off as you go, once you get more comfortable and once you, you know, find your grounding there. Would the would the public be sub, would be privy to the advice we give to the district and, and the board? Um, maybe, maybe not. Depends on the circumstance. Matters discussed in closed session, of course, were made completely confidential, and there's the attorney-client privilege to uh, obviously be concerned about as well. Uh, but some matters may want, you may want some kind of presentation openly and publicly from me, and if so, Obviously, if the board asks us to do that, we'll be happy to provide it. And uh, the board obviously is always uh, uh, able to direct us to provide advice in open session if it wishes. Um, and we, in closed session, might tell you whether or not we think that's a good idea, but it's ultimately, again, the board's decision. What's the emergency was the last of the three questions. Not having confidence in your counsel, walking into that doctor's office or the operating room without full confidence in who's gonna be performing the procedure. That's the, that's the emergency. Finally, you don't want yes men. We heard that comment. Uh, actually an excellent, an excellent comment. Um, but the and the board doesn't want yes men. The board also doesn't want no men, and it doesn't want yes women or no women either. It doesn't want someone who's just gonna parrot something or be agenda driven. That's not what we do. We'll give you the straight dope. We'll tell you where your authority is, where the limits of your authority are, what we think is the risk, what we think is, is in your interest, what we think is not, unvarnished and without any consideration to anyone else. And uh, we're not obviously only here to speak to you if we're engaged. We're delighted uh, and, and would be honored to have the opportunity to work with Dr. McClay. 
and with Mr. Robbins, if we can, we're here to help. We're here to add value. We're not here to waste resources. We're here to help the board proceed in confidence to do the work that the voters elected you all to do. And if we can help you do that, that'll be enough for us. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brenner. My thoughts for the board was maybe start with Mr. Schwartz and just come on down the line. And then if you have any questions for Mr. Brenner uh, and then and then points to make for me, the audience. Can I can I finish you, you Mr. Schwartz? Be excuse me. Excuse me, I didn't give I, you the floor yet, Mr. Schwartz. I'm, I'm trying to sorry, give you the floor. Ahead. Yeah. No, what I'm, I'm trying to say guys, is so I would ahead. like you to be able to ask questions to Mr. Brenner and then make your points to the audience in a reasonable fashion and we just go on down the line, starting with you. I don't have any questions right now for Mr. Brenner, but I hope you guys are in this for the long haul, because I am. First of all, Mr. Brenner, I'm not, I'm not addressing you, I'm addressing the board. We were told at the last meeting that the purpose of hiring a special counsel was to deal with a safety issue. Here you come with a whole litany of ideas and what you're going to do and why we're we didn't hire you for anything according to what I was told was a safety issue. So either someone fed you a line of baloney or someone fed the rest of the board a line of baloney because this thing is totally not transparent. I am outraged at the way we other board members were treated by whoever hired you. So that's my first question. Who engaged Mr. Brenner? Since the letter he wrote to the board is addressed to you, Mr. Kamrowski, I can only assume you were the one who engaged him. Is that correct? So I did, but I will let you know that the purpose of board discussion is not to interrogate another board member. No, so I'm I, I will to say, okay, okay. What's going on here? Yes. So I consulted many attorneys, and I and I have trust and confidence in Mr. Brenner, and that's as simple okay, as well, I'll get. I, 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 have. I have heard Mr. Brenner on the. Uh, let me make sure I have it on the California Insider interview, which is sponsored by Epic Times. If anyone knows who Epic Times is, it is a right-wing group that promotes things like QAnon. And I did hear Mr. Brenner, and I copied a couple of his quotes. He was on with a lady named Marie. Uh, I believe her name was Marie. I wrote it down. I'm sorry. Skipped it. Uh, he said that public schools are a monopoly. And public schools can't fail because they're not um, measured. Uh, I saw a whole dashboard tonight which measured the progress of our district and our schools. So that's a total fabrication or a total misunderstanding. Uh, <coughs> I'm just going to read some of my remarks that I prepared. Um, it's not surprising that you uh, landed on Mr. Brenner. Uh, the, his firm markets itself as specializing in the areas of healthcare and life sciences. After a rather in-depth review of its website, I was unable to find any reference to work in the area of K-12 education. It may exist, but it was hardly obvious from my search. The contract language of the engagement letter, I have some questions regarding the first two paragraphs on page four. The inclusion of these paragraphs is unusual and leads me to conclude that the attorneys have already undertaken work and incurred costs on behalf of the district. If that's true, who's going to pay those costs? This board did not authorize them to do any work for us. So whoever decided to engage them and have them do work. Mr. Schwartz, with all due respect, if you're going to if you're yes. going to go on with things that have already been answered, it really no, for the sake of time. No, this hasn't been answered. I'm sorry. My questions have not been answered. You know what? Just I've please make your points. And if enough, you have questions I for listen. Mr. Brenner, ask him directly so that we can go through the board. I'm not asking him. I'm I am making my general comments. 
I'm not speaking to Mr. Brenner. I'm making my own comments. And when it gets to be your turn, if you want to ask him, that's up to you. It says, the board may also contract for temporary specialized legal services without initiating an RFP when a majority of the board determines that the unique demands of a particular issue or emergency situation requires. I don't know, what, it, what is the emergency situation that he's going to address or what's the particular issue that he is going to address, Mr. Komorowski? If you want yeah, us to call this to question, Mr. Schwartz, you can keep on no, talking, I, but this no, is no, not I an interrogation. Know, I want to know the answers. How can I vote intelligently? I'm just going to let you continue make a few on. more points, and we're going to move on to Mr. Gonzalez for sake of time. You want to shut me up? That's up to you, and there were remedies. No, I think you're just going back. on and Thank on, you. Mr. Schwartz, and we're Go going on. in circles now. Thank you. Go on. Mr. Gonzalez? Act to follow, but I'll do my best. Um, uh, I, I, I was I was listening to that presentation, and answered a few of the questions that I had that were actually similar to some of the ones that Mr. Schwartz brought up. I, I don't know if my mic's not working or. <laughs> so, uh, I, I had some similar questions to what Mr. Schwartz uh, brought up. I, I heard the the answers to those questions directly. Um, the first one was, were, was there any work that already happened retroactive that we're going to be charged for, and who authorized that without the board voting to retain you as counsel? How were you giving us legal advice at all? Um, it's not my experience that that is a normal procedure, and the answer was it wasn't a normal procedure, and it hasn't happened. So as of right now, the bill is zero, so passed and answered. Um, the emergency, I think, as well, um, I, I think we're, we're focused on, on the emergency portion of that, um, section instead of the, the unique situation that we find ourselves in as a district. Um, we look around this room and we see the unique situation that we find ourselves in, the hyper-politicized climate that we find ourselves in, the, the, the fact that we're, we're changing job descriptions and adding additional staff just to handle the, the, the public records requests that are being thrown at us constantly. Um, there, there, there are issues, and I'm going to tell you right now that from, from probably the second week here, I, I've been asking about legal counsel. I've been asking about their, their history with the district. Um, my understanding is that, that Mr. Robbins has only been with the district a short time, and that we recently changed from one attorney in that firm to another because of issues, because of concerns, because there was not a lot of trust in the attorney that we we're currently using. So it's not like this attorney has a long history with this district. This is a newer attorney to our firm. Talk about the trust issue. Okay. When I ask questions and when I ask for, for legal advice as it pertains to my job as a board and I don't hear a response, I don't get an answer, and I don't feel like the attorney is responding, it, it's difficult. It, it ties our hands. We want to make sure that we're doing things correctly, that we're standing on solid legal ground when we're making decisions. And I have personally asked if there's another attorney within our district that we already have on council that we can reach out to for a second opinion. We have not gotten that. We have not received that information. We haven't heard anything about another attorney that we can go to. And I can tell you that this is a trust issue for me. For me, I'm only speaking for myself as a, as a board member. I do not have trust in the current general counsel to advise us on, on these specific matters. And we can benefit. I use them in my, my, my business often. I have three separate attorneys that, that I go to for different counsel, sometimes on the same issue, sometimes because I don't like the decision that I got. And I think that there's there's more uh, wiggle room on a, on a certain issue. So the benefit of, of an abundance of legal counsel is only to keep us on solid ground. And I personally think that, that it benefits us as a district and as a board moving forward. So that, that's where I live. Um, <clears throat> thank you for your presentation, Mr. Brenner. Um, so just to clarify, so you, you've you spoken to the attorney prior to this, like you worked with him to bring him here tonight. Is that correct? I've spoken with him about his services. Okay. And then Jen, you did as well. You've, you've clarified things with him, spoken with Mr. Brenner? We have spoken. Okay. And then you also told me that you have spoken with the attorney. Yeah. 
Okay. So, so according to government code section 54952.2, that's a Brown Act violation. So any, um, any communication directly or through intermediaries to discuss, deliberate, or take action on any item of business that is within the subject matter jurisdiction of the legislative body. It's called a serial meeting. And luckily, we, we did learn about that at our last training, and we were presented with a diagram here. And so this shows us this, this hub and spoke. So here, the hub is Mr. Brenner, and three of the spokes are our three board members here. So in my opinion, this is a moot point, because when we pass this, how many, how many people have their attorneys on speed dial and will sue us over this decision? That, you can read the case law right now, it's happened many, many times. Our other attorneys, which in case you're wondering, we have over five firms. And I'm positive if tonight we asked Dr. McClay, could we consult our five other firms already on retainer about any matters that you all have? We could set that up tonight. We could ask her right here at the meeting. I'm sure she'd be happy to do that. But as far as I'm concerned, if we proceed with this, we as a board are violating the Brown Act, and I think we need to stop talking about this right now. Mr. Brenner, could we ask you to speak to that at this point? Um, the process. Actually, I feel like we should have Mr. Robbins as our attorney. Yeah, I want to order. Us. A question was answered. And if, and if we want to clear the auditorium, we can. This is, the, this is the part where everybody just respects the board speaking and Mr. Brenner to engage. This as is where he we're is at. not our attorney, Joe, I would really ask that we first consult Mr. Robbins you had as a our question. attorney. You had a question? And Mrs. Wiersma is addressing that question, having him answer it right now. That's what the purpose of this discussion is for. This is transparency. This is you transparency. And this well, is where I would just like it on record that I am requesting that our actual attorney that is retained first on. He's making a conversation, Joe. That's extreme. Don't be extreme. This one right here has yelled at me three times and he's still sitting here. Come on. And, and Now back to Mr. Brenner. We'd like an answer to that question that Mrs. Wirsum asked you that Mrs. Barclay inferred. Um, the, uh, the question, as I understand it, is, uh, is the board prohibited from, from taking some action? I, uh, it's been correctly pointed out. I am not engaged as legal counsel, so I'm not going to be providing any legal advice. And any advice that I, I would provide, if engaged, uh, I would probably do so on a matter like this uh, in closed session, but that would have to be determined based on the advice sought. Um, two things I would note, though. Uh, first, my own personal view is that no violation of the Brown Act has occurred and that no serial meeting, as it's defined, has occurred. Uh, the Brown Act also does provide provisions for a, a complaint process, a cure process, uh, and the rest. So. Um, the Brown Act is often raised. It's very important to comply with it. It's an extremely important law, obviously, and it applies to this board, and the board ought to be compliant with it at all times. Um, it is not a trump card. It's not an absolute stop uh, to things necessarily, and there are ways to cure violations. Uh, I, I don't believe one's happened here. As I said, that's a personal view, uh, but that, and the board can decide what to do. That's your decision uh, tonight. Um, and uh, that would be my perspective on that particular technical issue. I would raise one other point, though. Um, once again, whether it's cloaked in just simply traffic language of pause, stop, or the technocratic language of the Brown Act, or we're going to get sued, <coughs> these all reflect a sentiment to Stop the board from getting additional legal advice. Stop it from getting advice from an outsider, worse than anything. Not beholden to us. Give us an RFP process conducted by staff so that we can control it. The board is perfectly allowed 
to have those procedures and get its advice in whatever way it wants. The board doesn't have to retain me. Doesn't have to. But if the board doesn't have confidence right now in its legal advisors, given the landscape on which you're operating, and as Trustee Gonzalez just noted, the unique circumstances of this environment at this time, you do need, in my opinion, to engage someone from the outside who's independent. It doesn't have to be me, but it should be someone, and it should be someone quickly. If I don't provide value, you can let me go the next day, or the next meeting, or the next special meeting. It's as simple as that. Thank you, Mr. Brenner. Mr. Wissema, the board the floor. Well, I think we need to hear, well, I'm not finished, actually. I have some more, but I'm ahead, still concerned. We haven't heard from Mr. Robbins on this point. Is he still available, Dr. McClay? I'm here, Dr. McCoy. Thank you, Mr. Robbins. Did you hear the question, uh, or, or would you like me to respond to the answer that you Sorry, if I can't hear what you just said. If you said okay. Something. I'm sorry, uh, Mrs. Barclay, jump in if I don't get this correctly, but it's my understanding that Mrs. Barclay would like to hear you speak to her description of three board members having spoken with Mr. Brenner as being a serial meeting or a violation of the Brown Act, she would like your legal opinion on that. Is that correct, Mrs. Barclay? Yes, please. Okay. The floor is yours, Mr. Robin. So without having complete information about the conversations that took place and whether information was shared about other board members' positions um, in those conversations, it's it's not necessarily possible right now to conclude that a Brown Act violation occurred. However, as I mentioned in my presentation, uh, any time a majority of the board uh, speaks uh, to a intermediary outside of a open and notice public meeting, it creates a potential perception problem that a Brown Act violation has occurred. Uh, it creates a scenario that opens the door to potential cure and correct demands under the Brown Act. Uh, and then to the extent that, you know, further issues are uh, brought to light, it, it, you know, raises the potential for oversight from the Riverside County District Attorney's Office if the problem is bad enough. Thank you. Um, well, I'm going to continue with my other um, comments then, um, just to make sure that um, I've been heard on the matter. Um, I understand that you have verbally told us, Mr. Brenner, um, changes to the letter. So are you willing to strike that from the final page of your, of your engagement letter? Are you willing to strike that section? Uh-huh. If you'd like me to just stay up here, I'm very happy to do it. it sure. Do you mean the, the, the portion of the letter dealing with the, the retroactive services? Yes, page four. Yeah, absolutely. We're happy okay. to strike that. and would, would be happy to do it tonight if you vote to engage us. Um, and then um, if you were engaged, are you willing to match the rate that we pay our other attorneys? We're not prepared to do that. The rate, um, <laughs> right, the, 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 it's a different kind of practice. Um, with lower rates, it puts pressure on having a volume practice, which is part of the problem that I spoke to earlier. Um, the rate that we have agreed to with the board, which was negotiated um, by the president, is substantially is it, it was substantially reduced. Um, and okay, so no, you're not willing to negotiate or to meet our rate. It, it's it's basically it reflects essentially a, a, a you know basically a 20 percent discount off of our after my normal sure. rate so but not, we it's are as a low district as, it's a little bit different it's like i run a nonprofit. people give us deals it's the district it, so okay. i appreciate that um, okay so got that we, we went as low as we could um and so um i mean my my other issue just lies with unique circumstances because as I see it, every two years is a unique circumstance in this district, right? Because our board turns over every two years. And I think our attorneys, you know, we don't, correct me if I'm wrong, but we don't keep the same attorneys for 
20, 30 years, they, they rotate as well um, within the district. I feel like we have a really good selection of people who specialize in districts. And I think we all saw the meeting last week. Um, you know, I'm sure Mr. Brenner's fantastic in his area, but, but the agenda was not correct, and that was on his advice. And that's what we all saw that night, was that the agenda was incorrect. So I really don't feel like we, we got good advice. Um, and my other issue that it just comes back to, and I'm really hoping, Joe, that you'll answer this, is that um, I did email you, I believe it was five to six times I did ask you, and on page one it says um, that, that the firm will provide service in the matter, quote, the matter. What is the matter that we're talking about? Because in my perspective, according to our board policy that has been quoted here tonight, we can only step outside that RFP process if there is a very unique circumstance. I don't think the board turning over is unique. I don't think these meetings are unique. I wasn't on the board during COVID, but they were worse than this. That was not, that, it's not that unique. There were years ago, years ago, there was all kinds of things. I've spoken with former board members. There were meetings just like this. It's not that unique. We've had walkouts all the time. Walkouts happen. Kids walked out because they didn't like where prom was being held. So these circumstances are not necessarily all that unique. And so I, my question is, and I, I know that you, know, you guys have mentioned you haven't talked to our current attorneys. Again, they're in-house, they're familiar. At least we could give them a try and hear what they have to say on whatever the matter is, but we still don't even know what that is. So, so I did email you, I did not receive a response regarding that question. Can you clarify what is, why did you initially call? What is the matter you want to discuss? The unique reason, emergency reason. You actually did get an answer from Mr. Brenner himself through an email. No, I didn't. On the he matter. said, I'm, I'm happy he to give said it again. to my, yeah, well, please. no, thank I'm, you. No, I don't need it again because I've read it a lot of times and I printed it out. And he said that his understanding is that Please order. the Let's matter um, has to do with um, safety, had to do with the safety that's happening. Um, and so, the recent student walkouts, potential obligations and responsibilities of the board, threats of liability and litigation associated with that. So, so is think, that the matter, know, the walkouts? So I think the problem here is you want me to convince you, and I'm not here to do that. I'm here to vote my values, and I encourage you to do the same thing. No, I'm just asking you a question. And I think that Mr. Brenner has already answered it. He said he wasn't sure. I'm happy he to answer here, it again. No, I, thank you. I appreciate your offer, but I, I, I have it in writing, so I definitely know what you said. And what it said was is that your understanding is this. It could be other things. So, so why can't you just tell us, Joe, why did you call him? Like, what is the reason? So, so we can understand. Yeah. So I'm going to let Mr. Brenner answer that again for you. No, it says right here. It says right here. He gave me the answer. I did not write the engagement letter. Mr. Brenner did. And no, that's but why, why did he you has call the authority to answer you. But why did you call Mr. Brenner? I don't have full confidence and trust in our current legal counsel. Again, we're going in a circle because I'm not trying to convince you. You're so you literally you literally should just vote your values and we can move on. Make your points to the audience. This is not interrogation. I am not interrogating it's not the my purpose values of the board are my values are the truth. My values are the okay. truth and transparency. Okay. And anybody who knows me, I'm a rule follower. So why are you resisting? I'm trying to understand why are you the resisting truth? a second answer? You've already been given it once. Why are you resisting another clip? Because he, he, he didn't call himself to request legal counsel. You called him <clears throat> to request legal counsel. And I've given you so the answer. So what is your reason? What? I've already given it to you. And because I've given you it to you on January 18th, and I'm done. You did not. I'm I've got done. it right here. You said, I'll refer you to Mr. Brenner. That Would, was your answer. All right. So my question is, so you're saying, just to clarify, your reason was because you didn't have confidence in our legal counsel. That's Correct. why you called him? Correct. Okay. And, but you haven't talked to the rest of our legal counsel, just the one you don't have confidence in. Is that right? I, I have her. Yeah, I'm gonna let. I'm gonna. I'm just gonna end the discussion with you because it's it's going it's going too far. I'd like to hear from Mrs. Wersman. Just asking a question. Okay. I'm, I'm feel you're really in, bad. You're that actually I it. you're on borderline of interrogating, and I've said this probably four or five times. It's not the purpose of board discussion. The purpose of board discussion is to make your points to the crowd. <laughs> 
ask, thank you. ask your questions. Thank you, thank you, thank you You're so welcome. much and for I did, your advice. And I did answer your question. I do know what interrogating means and I also know what a discussion entails. And again, I have reached out to all of you to talk to you and the only person that ever talks to me is Danny. And unfortunately, this, this board that we want to work together it's not happening, and this is why. You want me to convince you, and I can't do that. I absolutely don't need to be convinced. I just would like an answer. But apparently, we're not going to have this, so here's our transparency vote. So, so here's the thing I want to add right here is I, I, I appreciate the fact that today we did talk about some things that we agree on, and I hear exactly what you're saying. Um, and I think we're going to move forward in the next few months and have that more and more. I'm committed to that. I am. This is a different era. It has been a great deal. There's, there have been a lot of challenges to communicate what is going on behind the scenes. You're not privy to all of that. I'm not gonna say due diligence because that's on the bingo square. You did? And I have a Starbucks card for the winner if, if somebody gets a bingo. But here's the deal. We have dealt with so many interesting situations and I've spent some time talking to Mr. Brenner. He offers a perspective that I can trust in an objective manner. And here's the thing, he's solely focused on advising the board. That's exactly the point that he's made. It's one thing to have representation with the district. It's another to have that as a board. And that is what's, yes, it's what's important to me because I was elected to do this job by thousands of constituents, thousands. So at this point, I don't feel like I'm failing. I feel like we've been failed with some of what's gone on. And I could sit here and talk to you for a half an hour about it. Well, then let's come together and start talking. I'm we calling this to question. I call for a motion to second discuss temporary specialized legal services for unique issues and emergency situations. Do I have a motion and a second? I move it. Yes. We've already discussed it. All in favor say aye. You have to make a motion to rescind the specialized legal services temporary council with the one suggestion I believe it was page. Amended. Well, last paragraph. Okay, so I call for a motion to second to discuss temporary specialized legal services for unique issues and emergency situations, barring the last paragraph and an amendment. How about um, you need to call for a motion to approve the selection of Mr. Brenner's firm as temporary specialized legal counsel with his engagement letter striking the retroactive paragraph on page. Four. So you need a motion for that, and then a second, and then all in favor. Moved. Second. What? What? I'm what giving you the motion. Place, uh, I shouldn't make the motion, though. So somebody needs to repeat that from the board. It is your motion. That's I'd okay. Like There's a the lot motion. that goes on behind this. It. I've said before, it's not as easy as it looks. Okay. So, let me try it one more time. Um, I would make a motion to approve the contract with Mr. Brenner's firm using the engagement letter he provided, but striking the paragraph about retroactive pay on page. I'd like to make a motion to engage Mr. Brenner's firm, EBG, to retain striking striking the last paragraph on page four in regards to retroactive fees. Do I have a motion and a second? Moved. Moved. Second. Yes, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those against? No. Strongly oppose for your bingo card. <laughs> okay, so motion adopted three to two. Gonzalez, Kamrowski, and Wearsmith. All right, we're going to negotiations update. Thank you. Thank you, 
President Komorowski. I'll, I'll be brief and start with a negotiations update with TVA with the board action this evening to approve the retiree medical bridge MOU. We will begin to partner with risk management and TVA to get the word out to potential retirees. Discussion regarding the possibility of renewing the TK5 case, manage, case management MOU with TVA are ongoing and as Mr. Diaz shared earlier, we hope to have a positive resolution to this in the very near future. The joint TVA, TVUSD ad hoc budget committee will meet again on Tuesday, February 7, 2023. On the CSEA side of things, we meet with CSEA and uh, our district and CSA negotiations team tomorrow, Friday, February 1st, and Friday, February 3rd. New classified employee work calendars, which include the Juneteenth holiday, was sent to all site departments to hand out to employees. President Karoski, that's it for my negotiations update. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ars. Now we're into board comments. Would you like to go first, Mr. Schwartz? No. Okay, Mr. Schwartz passes. Mr. Gonzalez? No, I didn't say I passed. Oh, I, I thought said you said I no. I don't want to go first. Please don't speak for me. I said I don't want to go first. Very well. Mr. Gonzalez? Board comments. Hey, this is the fun part. Um, let me. Um, <laughs> I, I just wanted to share. It's been a it's been a busy couple of weeks um, with a with a, a meeting thrown in the middle of it. Um, but uh, I got to do some some of the the fun stuff um, here in the last couple of weeks. I wanted to um, to first uh, point out the the site visit that I was able to do at Rancho Elementary, um, which was absolutely awesome. Um, walking that that school site with with. Uh, with Dr. <laughs> Dr. McClay and, and, and walking with the, the principal over there and meeting our staff, seeing them in their element, um, interacting with, with those students, walking into classrooms um, that, that my, my kids are in similar classrooms at another, at another school, and just seeing how, how the, the education process is working. It was really encouraging um, to see what's going on um, in those school sites, and um, they should all be really proud over at, at uh, Ranch Elementary because they've got it an amazing group of people over there and they're, they're doing great things. Um, I was also um, thrilled to, to attend my first uh, CTE uh, advisory council meeting this morning uh, at Bella Vista Middle School. We got to walk that CTE site. And, and um, that, this is the stuff that, that we really need to be showing parents. This is the stuff that we need to be talking about. And we need to have huge banners up everywhere saying, you know, look at this. Um, that, that for me is, is the absolute future of education. Um, I, I, I was thrilled to see what was already going on. And, and honestly, uh, Dr. McClay, um, Mr. Dignam, if I don't think he's here tonight. <laughs> uh, he's hiding over there. Um, I, I, honestly, I think all of you and everybody that's been involved in that, including some of the past uh, boards that have worked on these things, um, you should all take a bow because that work that you've already done is amazing. And uh, I'm honored to be a part of what's going to come next. So um, that's really it for me. Um, I don't have much else to say. Thank you. Um, thanks. Yeah, I was able to attend several events over the last month, which is always my favorite part. I was at Great Oak for their the basketball game they talked about, and wow. Those students are amazing. It was fantastic. It was it was a great game. Um, you know, one in town school did really well. The other one, it was a little rough, but it was a very fun game, and seeing the crowd was fantastic. Um, I went in another game over at TVHS. Um, super fun to see girls and boys out there and, and lots of people out there supporting. Um, I was able to go to Temecula Elementary. Uh, go Tigers. I love that school. It's so fantastic. We, they had a math and literacy night and so many parents there. It was fabulous. Um, I saw our mayor was there visiting as well and lots of students and parents I got to, I got to say hi to and just see everyone interacting and it was fantastic. And I do, you know, I'm really um, so grateful to be able to continue to support our district in this way. Um, this is not an easy job and it's not even my job, but um, it's not an easy task for any of us, and um, I do. I am passionate about it. I'm passionate about kids, and I'm passionate about what I believe in, and I know that comes through. I'm not aggressive, just passionate. Um, but it is unfortunate that um, 
we are not working together better for our students, and I hope we'll get better at that. Um, we don't need these distractions. We don't need these arguments. We don't need you guys having to give up time with your kids and out of your homes. Um, we just need to push forward. And it's still just surprising to me um, that we're at this point, that it isn't obvious how great our district is and has been um, by our presentation tonight, by our teachers coming out here and supporting our kids and listening to what they have to say, by what we see when we go to the schools. It is fantastic, and we are on the right trajectory. And all of these changes proposed, I am not against change. Ask my staff at work, I love it. Bring me change all day long. However, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And I feel like we are, it's sad to be this distracted. And I hope that as a board, we can make a concerted effort to stop distracting the cabinet so that they can do their jobs and that we can do our jobs and work together better as a board and set an example for the kids and the teachers. I just wanna thank everyone that's here that took your time. It's valuable, you being here tonight, regardless of where you are on the issues, I want you to know I appreciate you. We are in a tough spot, but I'm really hopeful because I think we will work past a lot of things. And it's the joy of being on the campuses that I know will um, connect us. I had such a great time at Alamos. Today, it was a day where they were celebrating the 100 days of school, and they were all little old ladies with buns and curlers. And I walked in there, I'm like, these are my people. I just, I felt like I fit right in. It was old person day, and let's celebrate, and everything about school, and crafts, and Valentines, and um, teachers shaking my hand, and me just letting them know, I appreciate you. I do. And I think you're gonna find out that this board, the, the newer members were multifaceted. We have so many different priorities priorities that we want to address and we want to work with you and, and we will. Um, it's an honor. I went to Bella Vista the other day and just to see their CTE program was amazing. A couple of boys kind of fashioning a prosthetic and working with fabric for the medical field, seeing what kids were doing with the videography, a gal who was working with a drill on teeth. I mean, I love it love being able to encourage our kids and it was the best part of my week you know i knew tonight would be hard but i'm very hopeful that we'll mend some of these fences and i think one of the best things that we could see in this town is an aspect of forgiveness it's tough it's tough we all have things that we face that are hard i have a best friend of 33 years who called me about a week ago and she's very, very sick. She is dying. And she, she is, she is, she was my college roommate, someone that I love with all my heart. There's heart again. Um, I can't even tell you what it's gonna be like for me to go through it. And you know what she's doing? She's encouraging me with this. She is encouraging me to be the best trustee that I can be as she's in a hospital bed. And those are the stories you don't know, you know about us, what's going on in our life. My friend does not want it to be a distraction. She knows I feel called and I am so excited to be a part of this school board. And she's, she's dying. So I'm gonna love her and I'm gonna do the best job I can as a trustee. And I'm gonna try to win a lot of you over with the fact that I'm willing to work harder and longer and meet our students where they're at. Thank you to Kimberly for taking me to the campuses this week, it was sweet to talk to the principal, to go into a classroom where that first grade teacher, Miss Salibi, she was my son's first grade teacher and he's a senior. And I will tell you, he's an amazing kid. He's an amazing kid. Not a perfect kid. I'm not a perfect mom. I'm not a perfect trustee, but I'm committed to learning and I'm committed to being humble all of the things. So I want you to know there's a real genuine aspect to that. Um, as far as our students, I know I, I, a couple of them still have questions about the resolution and we're committed to that, the conversations. We're working on those things, whether it's committee. Um, Joe and I have been working to put together a forum and, and that's gonna come into play. We're not done, we're reaching, we're reaching out and we want you to know that we're We're really thinking seriously about what we can do so that the students know we do hear them and we do care. 
And it probably sounds like platitudes up here, and I'm sorry if it sounds that way, but we're excited about that. And uh, thank you to Mr. Vickery for the time that I've spent talking to him about safety. I've gone into the district office and have had some great conversations, and I'm grateful for all of it. So with that, that was a lot, but um, just know I'm committing myself to go above and beyond. And you do have my word on that. Thank you. So I want to th uh, say thanks for everybody uh, for coming out. And one thing about me is that I'm not a night owl. I'm an early bird. So thank you for being patient with me when, while I'm learning my role as board president. Um, with that being said, um, I have a few items. I've had the wonderful, mind-blowing privilege of visiting all seven of my schools and my trustee areas in the last two weeks. I take it very seriously. I'm an educator, and I could not wait to meet everybody. And again, so thank you, Dr. McClay. Thank you, Ms. Vallis. Thank you, Ms. Ms. Lash. Um, it was it was an awesome time. I got to you know. I, I can't name all the names, or I'd be up here all night and all the experiences I had. But it was awesome, um, Mrs. Waddell. Uh, Mrs. Pfeiffer at uh, Abby Ranke, uh, Mr. Hankey and, and, and Taylor um, at Crown Hills. I can't wait to see uh, what beard, uh, what color Mr. Hankey is going to dye his beard because he got into a bed or something with his students. He's got a, and I, I said, you look kind of like a king with that beard. He goes, I don't even wear beards. And I'm like, well, why are you wearing a beard? There was something going on with his students, but then, then there's this bet where he has to dye it and they have to pick the color. So I, I'm looking forward to that. Can't wait to go back. Um, Mrs. Zikafus at Vintage Hills, Mrs. Leone at TV, uh, Temecula High School, Mr. Schlotman at Rancho Vista High, and all the things he's got going on there is just mind-blowing how he can contain it all. Um, Temecula High School, I saw the CTE uh, Culinary Arts. Um, I can't even describe it. Again, mind-blowing doesn't even do it justice. It's, it's insane. I can't wait to go back and see all the other CTE programs. The SPED staff, hold on. I would like to reclassify your job title as miracle worker, because that's what you are, all of you, SPED related in all the schools. Mind blown. <laughs> to make it a high school, I give this challenge to the chess club. I challenge you all to one match, one move a day, no database, no cheating. If you win, I will do 50 ranger push-ups in the middle of that high school during lunch. If I win, you give me 50 push-ups, all of you, the whole chess club. The challenge stands. Do you accept? So these are the experiences that I had, and they're real, and they're tangible. And again, as an educator, this is the most profound part of my job that I love, watching the teachers engage with different you know, levels of pedagogy. And secretly, I'm stealing your techniques. When I'm in that class, you're like, oh my gosh, I'm being evaluated. No, no, no. I'm getting my mind blown. And I'm like, I like that technique. I'm going to use that with my students. I'm going to use this with my students. The music program at Temecula Middle School, phew, I could stand there for days and never leave. Listen to the kids sing, I, I, just on and on and on. So um, I've met a lot of teachers who are proud to be a part of TVUSD and students and staff, and, and I'm proud to be a part of it too. And my commitment was to visit the schools as fast as I could and, and again. So um, that's, that's one uh, part of this journey that I, I was really excited about. And I thank you all for um, welcoming me onto your campuses, and I look forward to meeting you again. Um, secondly, as an audience, uh, the audience may recall the governing handbook portion of the board workshop on January 10th was postponed. Uh, Jody and myself thought it wise to create a, a, a board workshop in February with a guest speaker that specializes in positive governance team culture. And this goes back to the um, pages 12 through 14 in our governance handbook, where we could learn how to um, trust build, work on effective interpersonal communication. So we can work on the uh, governing handbook at that time in February. Um, next topic, uh, Mr. Diaz, I spoke with you. And just to touch on it, I, for those of you who don't know, I, I met Mr. Diaz for lunch and, and um, Andy for lunch, the you know presidents of CSEA and president of TVA before I was even sworn in, and I said, look, what can I do to advocate for the teachers to get more competitive pay, the full-timers in Temecula Valley and the subs right away? And then with Andy, I said, what can I do to advocate to get you whatever you need? Now, I'm aware that I'm not a part of the negotiations, 
But nevertheless, what can I do to advocate for you? So from educator to educators, I'm advocating for you. That goes down to your, your competitive pay, your COLA, whatever I can do, even though, like I said, I'm not a part of these negotiations. So that's what's going on in the back, background. You never have to ask yourself, you know, I wonder what, if he knows what it's like to be an educator. I am one. I just don't teach K through 12. I still deal with students in my logic and critical thinking classes. Some of them are like kids, even though they're 18, 19, and 20. I get them right after you're done with them at high school. So with that in mind, um, Mr. Diaz, it was glad to meet you. I look forward to, again, we can talk about soccer and we can sign up for these subgroups. We can do that starting tonight when this meeting's done. Last, um, and this, this goes into, um, this undergirds the um, critical race theory um, that people are concerned with and how to teach that in their class. If they're gonna teach it, it's considered a controversial issue. There's other controversial issues that um, um, teachers can uh, bring into their classrooms. They don't have to have, they don't have to second guess teaching that even though it's controversial and there's a way to do it. And so um, a controversial issue, issues policy, um, teachers with age appropriate conf, um, controversial issues can talk about things like stem cell uh, research, cloning, uh, the ethics of war, critical race theory, racism, what, the, what, what, what I don't really want to see is teachers giving their viewpoints. How about giving a neutral perspective? You give the, the pros and then the cons of the argument. So I'm going to work on um, um, possible resolution that will support the, the teachers to feel empowered to bring a controversial issue into their classroom and not worry about it. Just like, this is it, but I'm going to remain neutral. I'm going to give you all it takes to be able to assess the pros and cons of this. You can take it home with your parents. So that's just a forecasting, um, and that's, that's it for me. Mr. Schwartz, and thank you. Thank you. Wow. Listening to the three of you, we have nothing to work on. Everything is great, and I agree. So I'm going to just give a little bit of what I've been up to. Um, first of all, I've been in contact with uh, our night custodians and uh, talking about what they do, and I've gotten great feedback from our staff on how they work, what they do, and I just want to compliment a couple of people who look out for those people. One is Donna Perinich, she's a teacher at Alamos, and Michelle Wessel, who works at Nicholas Valley. Both of them actually put out treats for our night custodians because they know how hard they work. I also want to thank Suzanne Kurtz from uh, Crown Hill and Chris Lindbergh from French Valley for their kind notes to me. I always appreciate hearing from teachers and uh, I, I appreciate their support. <clears throat> uh, I had a pretty busy two weeks. Uh, I was at Great Oaks High School for the Girls Water Polo Senior Night. It was a really nice event. I posted it on my page. Um, I was at Helen Hunt Jackson. I spent some time in the special ed classrooms with autistic children. And it is amazing. Those people who work with those children are saints. It is just unbelievable to see how they work with those children, how devoted they are. Uh, Danny, thank you uh, for CRT. The people who need to take a bow, especially are Sandy Hinkson and Adam Skumowitz, who were the ones who piloted the CTE programs through our board, and they are magnificent programs, that is true. I met with our state senator today, Kelly, uh, not today, the other day, Kelly Sayardo, who's our state senator, talked to him about education funding. He's in our pockets. I don't mean he's in our pockets. He's behind us in terms of funding education. He also has a new uh, fentanyl um, initiative that he started, and I'm totally in agreement with that. And he seems to be very supportive of our schools and what we do here. Also, as a Vale Ranch, I met with the uh, with the people who were volunteers there. Had a nice chat with them, and that's about it. Uh, I hope from now on that our meetings will be less contentious, that we can work together, and the reason we're here is the students and their education. Thank you. Good night.
Dr. McClay for Superintendent Collins. Is anybody tired? Yes, I'll be super, super fast. My two favorite parts of tonight, the recognitions portion at the beginning of the meeting, if you didn't get a chance to get a seat and you weren't in the room, awesome Great Oak Band statewide champions, Temecula Valley High School cross country, boys and girls top GPAs in the country, 4.3, 4.1. Not too shabby. Shelby Walton, a teacher who deserves a Medal of Honor over at Day Middle School. It was so awesome to honor her. And then to our board, we got to recognize them um, for statewide school board recognition month. So again, not very many folks know how hard your job is and how much time it takes. So thank you very, very much on behalf of our entire district. And then my second favorite part of the meeting, albeit short, we got to talk about student learning a little bit tonight with Mrs. Brown's presentation on the dashboards. Our kids hit it out of the park, as always, but it's always exciting to talk about why we really do what we do, and that's to be sure that our kids are learning. So with that, I'm out so that everybody can go home and go to bed. So then, future agenda items. Are you discussing that, Dr. McClay, or just? Oh, typically we do recap. Yeah, yeah, okay. And then we'll go into, okay. Future agenda items, board workshop in February. I briefly talked about that, uh, a forecasting of what's to come. Staff will, be, will present information on the following agenda items for the next regular board meeting in February 2023. College and career readiness, A through G, completion, CTE teacher salary schedule, there's an MOU, facilities report, project update, Superintendent progress report closed. And now on item uh, B, we go into closed session. So kindly. So Dr. Yeah. Komorowski, you would need to just state that the board does have a need to go back into yeah. closed session. We did not finish the closed session agenda prior to going into open. We have one last item, which was anticipated litigation. We'll go back into closed session. We have to have the room clear for that. And then we have to come back in and publicly do a readout if anything was done and close the meeting. So you're welcome to wait. I don't know that there's a real need, but that's up to The board did not take any action in closed session. So that convenes a closed session. So now why announcement of the next meeting? The next regular open session business meeting of the governing board of education is scheduled for February 21st, 2023. And we have a workshop before that on February 14th. Adjournment, this meeting is adjourned Tuesday, January 31st, 2023 at 11.37 p.m.